Salam fenomena. Aduh, lupa hendak. Saya ni kan? Saya ni kan? Oh, kunisan ya, mas Koda? Oh, kunisan, kunisan, kunisan. Ya, jauh saya semua naik lagi. Tadi sama, itu lagi apa naik lagi? Apa naik lagi? Ah, ah. Ah. Sing sir, good morning. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, sir, good morning. Good morning, sir. Ah, good morning. Ah, good morning. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes, 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 yes. Pasca dah ahi sini ye? Oh, terus terus aku mai su. Oh, tiga sa. Aku mai su, aku mai su. Okay. Ready tak? Siang tu show sing sir aku mai su. Oh. Bodoh kasih kalau. Dekhi su. Dia dia. Oh. Masuk mana kalau? Ah, eh, nibir, kuma, kuma boleh sesta kau dia se nibir eh? Oh, apa? Good morning. Good morning, sir. Okay, sir. So everything okay.
बीटू आसा बीटू बीटू आसा ने हेलो हेलो गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग गुड मॉर्निंग हाउ आर यू गुड आई वाज ट्राइंग हार्ड टू जॉइन ओके नाइस टू सी यू अकुजा डूइंग गुड Yes, how are you? Good, good. I just finished my class during the meet. Okay. Okay. Kilamar, very good morning. Kilamar sir, very good morning to you. One. Yes, sir. Hello, Baskoda. Kilamar sir, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How are yes, you? Yes, sir. Everybody nice well? to see you, sir. Yes. Well, thank you for the invitation to be here again. All right. Okay, sir. All right. Sir. First step.
morning, sir. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Jana. Oh, sir. Hi. <laughs> sir, you are in Guwahati? Yes, yes. Hello? 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 Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Hello, I'm going to ask you. Okay. How about this? Hello? 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 Hello?
Good morning, sir. Professor Miri, sir, good morning. <laughs> good morning. I am Sham Kishor. Can you hear me now? Hello, Professor uh, Yes. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Where is your picture? I can't find. Yeah, I found it now. <laughs> How are you? Oh, I am quite fine. So a very long time. A uh, long time. So hope uh, Madam is fine. Okay. <laughs> no, right. It was very nice meeting you after a long time. Uh, yes, yes, it's nice to see you. But nice, nice talking to you. How are things in Manipur? Ah, uh, yes, but uh, the problem of this <laughs> this mm. disease is uh, spreading. <laughs> uh, it's a very serious problem in Manipur also, uh, right now. Delhi also is uh, just. Uh, yes, it is. Has come down, but uh, again we are uh, waiting for the third wave to come. It's ah yes yes yes. yes. Uh, so. <laughs> you you are in the university, no? Uh, no, sir. I have retired long time back, oh. and uh, right now I am residing in Gauhati. I have a house oh. in Gauhati city. Okay. Yes, I was I was serving previously in Dhaka University. I know this. I know. This. I know this. <laughs> so then, the... so you have a home in Dhaka. Uh, yes, yes, yes. How nice. But uh, uh, Manipur University has a good department of philosophy, you know, does it? Uh, yes, uh, they are managing. Most of them are young, but young. Uh, some have retired. Uh, yeah. So they are pulling on. Yeah. I was till uh, to 2018, I was uh, taking part, uh, some classes. But after that, I have given up. I'm staying in Gauhati since then. <laughs> and you speak Assamese? You... I, I, but not speaking very well, but I understand to some extent. <laughs> you see, my uh, mother, yes. who's dead now, he, she died in uh, 2004. Yes, my, I know. Uh, my mm -hmm. mother is a tutor. Uh, yes. Now, what is she called? The daughter, yes, the king of ah, uh, yes. Manipur. When he used yes. to be in yes, yes, yes. She's now. Uh, what is she called now? She. Her name is uh, Devi. Uh, I forgot her name. So she oh. used to talk a great deal about Manipur, the Maharaja of Manipur. Oh, yes. 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 Those were golden days, but <laughs> they are gone. <laughs> morning, sir. Oh, sorry. Yeah, good morning. Sir, I, I was your student in Nehu in 2002. Were you? Uh, basically, Mrs. Miri was there. Sata Miri. Mrs. Miri was there. I passed out in 2002 from the home. Okay. Now, now I am in Gauti University. Right, right. Good to see you, sir. You were uh, a Koyjam. Yes, sir, a Koyjam. Yes. Yeah, is fine. She, yeah, she talks to me about you, yes. Uh, but I, I don't remember teaching you, actually. You, you used to visit and take some class, Plato class. Okay. You were then the vice chancellor. So you were very busy. <laughs> you used to visit our department. Nice to see you, sir.
পাহৰি থাকিল নহয় হেৰি কৰিব morning to all uh, honorable vice chancellor of prashna kanta handic state open university professor kondrapa das distinguished invited speakers respected directors of all the schools respected seniors my dear colleagues and research scholars i tejasha kalita on behalf of uh, discipline of philosophy surya kumar huya school Bye. of social sciences uh, friends welcome you all to the panel discussion of philosophy ethics and aesthetics uh, it, uh, we have organized this program to mark the occasion of indian philosophy day 2021 
we are pleased to inform you that this event is sponsored by Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi. We would like to begin this program with the musical presentation given by Sri Nivir Dev Sharma. He is presently pursuing Masters in Instrumental Music from Ravindra Bharati University and has taken part in various events across India. He is also a recipient of silver medals two times at Gauhati University Youth Festival. Now, I request our guest, Sri Nivi Dev Sharma, to delight us with this musical presentation. Hello, everyone, and good morning to all of you. Uh, am I on the Hello, am I audible? Uh, uh, thank you for having me here. And uh, today I am accompanied by Zun uh, on Kiss. And I will try to play a composition uh, which is on Rag Days and uh, just a devotional composition. Okay.
थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच Thank you, Mr. Sharma, for such a melodious presentation. Now, I request Honorable Vice Chancellor Professor Kandarpa Das sir to inaugurate this program. Uh, thank you, Das sir. Good morning uh, to you all. Uh, respected Professor Minal Miri, Professor P R Bhad, Professor Sam Kishore Singh, uh, my colleagues, invited participants. and ladies and gentlemen indeed it's a privilege for me to be invited here to inaugurate this webinar which has been organized on the occasion of indian philosophers day by the school of social sciences of this university and which has been sponsored by indian council for philosophical research uh, for organizing this webinar we in this university krishna kanda hanik state open university have been trying to utilize the best technology in order to transform the disadvantages the challenges which has been posed by the coronavirus pandemic into an opportunity and have been trying to organize various lectures webinars seminars workshops so that the intellectual discourse and the process of learning of our learner and research scholar are open even during the pandemic and this is indeed a great step by the fact uh, the discipline of philosophy they have decided to organize this webinar on a very uh, relevant area of philosophy i believe our eminent speakers invited speakers will uh, throw light in the area and our scholars and the students will be greatly benefited also our faculty members i do not want to speak for a very long time once again on behalf of the krishna kanda hanik state open university i express my sincere thanks and gratitude to our invited speaker especially professor minal miri sir who have accepted our invitation to join us and speak on this occasion so on behalf of the university i welcome you all once again and declare this webinar formally inaugurated thank you very much thank you sir now i request the coordinator of this program dr vaska charya to introduce the district with speakers and also in thank you uh, tejas sir honorable uh, vice chancellor sir professor kadavada sir distinguished uh, speakers of today's function distinguished uh, professor john robert lemar sir from kyoto university respected professors and officers colleagues and my dear students and research scholars friends it is a fact that we are passing very desperate and painful days and out of this prevailing situation of covid 19 pandemic we have lost some noble souls which is really an irreparable loss to the humanity so let us pray to the almighty on this auspicious occasion that their departed soul rest in peace and the almighty to give us blessings and positive spirit to win over the global situation around us first of all i am thankful to indian council of philosophical research new delhi for entrusting upon us the great responsibility for holding the online event on the theme of philosophy ethics and aesthetics the subject philosophy 
is an umbrella concept. It embraces the issues of ethics and aesthetics. This webinar will especially reflect upon the issues centering on philosophy, ethics, and aesthetics. I also feel privileged and expressing deep gratitude to our eminent speakers of today's program, Professor Minal Merisar, Professor Pierre Bhatsar, Professor Sam Kishor Singh sir, for readily agreeing to deliver their online lectures on the proposed theme. Hope all of us virtually present here will enjoy the deliberations by actively participating in this program, enriching the minds with philosophical insight and spirit drawn from this event and make the program vibrant and a great success. It is also informed to all of you that after the deliberation of the three lectures, you may send your observations, queries in chat box and keeping on the gravity and seriousness of the queries will be discussed respectively in the interactive session. It will be open for 10 minutes only. Respected participant friends, let us move to the online panel discussion program. Uh, although according to the CEDL, the first lecture to be delivered by P.R. Bhatsar due to technical problem, he is not now joining here. He will be joining afterwards. So at the outset, I would like to invite Professor Miri sir to deliver the first lecture on religion and Satyagraha. So before handing over this session to Professor Miri sir, I would like to uh, briefly introduce to Professor Miri sir. Professor Miri sir, a well-known philosopher, educationist, started his prolific career as a lecturer in philosophy at Stephen College under the University of Delhi. Before moving to Nehu Shilong, Professor Miri also served as the director of Indian Institute of Advanced Studies, Simla, from 1993 to 1999. He was also a chairperson of Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi. He was nominated as a member of Rajya Sabha on 21 March 2012. He has been awarded a Padma Bhushan for his contribution in the field of education and literature. Among the important publications to his credit, Identity and Moral Life, published by uh, Oxford University Press 2002, Philosophy of Education, published by Oxford University Press 2014, and among the edited books, the Place of Humanities in Our uh, Universities, published by Rootless 2018, are world famous. May I now request Professor Minal Mirisar to deliver the speech on modernity, religion, and Satyagraha. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, have I been unmuted? I presume everyone can hear me. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, there is a, a my the title of my paper is a little bit misleading. Um, although you know the the, um, the topics that the title suggests um, I'm going to be dealing with. Uh, these, uh, these issues are certainly uh, a part of what I have to say in this lecture, but I think it would be much better uh, titled as the, the lecture would be much better titled as uh, Morality, Western and Indian. Morality or ethics, I prefer ethics uh, to morality, but that's another matter. Morality, uh, Western and Indian. Now, 
Um, the primary influence on Western morality uh, for a very, very long time now, primary influence has been uh, religion and particularly the Christian religion. Why particularly, exclusively the Christian religion? The influence on morality, morality of the people. Now, um, for um, within within this uh, outlook of morality, morality uh, as the gift of religion, as the gift of God. Now, uh, to be moral within this outlook of morality, to be moral is to surrender to God's will and follow his sovereign rules for all humanity. Now, the, when Western modernity um, you see, came into its um, um, you know, independent, as it were, uh, uh, status, that is with uh, the Enlightenment Kant, when uh, so, so Western modernity kind of this enlightenment threatened to oust, as it were, religion out of the arena of morality. But this didn't quite happen. That's another story. I'll come back to it. Uh, now, enlightenment morality, for it, the domain of morality is strictly within the domain of logos. By logos, I mean reason and speech. As long as morality derived from religion requires an overriding speechless faith in God. Finally, the uh, faith in God has to be speechless, uh, independent of logos. As long as morality derived from religion requires overriding speechless faith in God, it is inviolable by reason and knowledge. And the enlightenment, on the other hand, the enlightenment in this, uh, in intervention um, says morality is strictly within the domain of reason. It is secular, um, not speechless faith in God, which is the basis of morality. Now, there are two views of modern uh, Western uh, views. There are two views. Morality and its universality dictated by universal autonomous reason. That is Kant, everybody knows. Emotions and other non-cognitive properties of the mind are not part of the arena of morality. The second view, the end of secular morality is happiness. This, as you know, this is the utilitarian view. This is generally accepted uh, in Western society and also Western intellectual kind of uh, uh, arena. Now, um, the end of secular morality is happiness for all, the greatest happiness of the greatest number. But since the concept of happiness is quite doggedly unclear, and there may be more views, some mutually incompatible, about the nature of happiness, then it may quite deceptively appear to begin with, the modern Western mind seems to have replaced the idea of happiness with that of liberty. As though liberty were an easier concept to grasp than happiness. The largely accepted modern view is that liberty must be the goal of non-theological morality. Morality consists in applying the right means to achieve the end, this end. The morality of an action is strictly proportionate to its utility in the pursuit of this end. The details and shape of modern moral thinking in the West are the result of combining these two in subtly different ways, these two views. However, a particular combina combination of these two views has often led to somewhat distasteful moral worldviews. Thus, human beings, 
on one such view are unique among all beings because they alone are endowed with reason which enables them to decide between the right and the wrong between the moral and the immoral however not all human beings are endowed or adequately endowed with reason whereby they can be they, they can validly distinguish between right and wrong good and bad they cannot therefore be proper mutually responsive moral interaction between such human beings and the ones who are endowed with reason there are two attitudes possible for the moral, morally endowed to the ones who are not so endowed one the natural attitude of pity and sympathy for the latter who after all are capable of suffering pain and two an urge to lift their level of rationality so that one day they can become full members of the moral human community the animal exemplifies the being who must be excluded from abstract equality who has voice but not speech the animal the animal would include usually those who are this is very important the animal would include usually those humans who cannot reason and talk historically massive examples of such animal humans would include women slaves colonized uh, american indians and terrorists this you will recognize recognize is the famous white man's burden of european european colonialism throughout the non white world it is quite natural to nation nationwide civilizations no, sorry it is quite natural for non white civilizations to react sharply to this extraordinary attempt of the european colonials to de degrade the amazingly rich and fecund ethical thinking moral traditions and practices of their colonial subjects not just in their own eyes but in the eyes of their subjects the two aims of course go together one effectively setting the other in motion the reason and utility but think of the indian tradition which is embedded uh, which has embedded in it the dharma shastras the gita the epics of ramayana and mahabharata the jaina and buddhist interventions and the puranas the idea that human beings are unique among all earthly creatures in that day and only they have the gift of reason and the capacity to distinguish between the moral and the immoral is common between the western religious tradition which i mentioned at the beginning the so called abrahamic tradition and the western modernity the idea is also at the heart of western secularism and the claim is that this secularism which is pervasive in the western articulation of law politics economics etc has come to the non european world from the west the non european world has appropriated it in a break from its own traditions even derrida endorses the view that modernity's articulation of secularism basically in abrahamic language is the gift of europe to the rest of the world thus derrida i quote modernity emerges from and is articulated in abrahamic language which is not in the case of japan or korea because he didn't study india japan or korea for example that of the dominant religions of their society but which has become the universal idiom of law of politics of the economy or of diplomacy at the same time the agent and symptom of the internationalism that is abrahamic language and and the spread of abrahamic uh, the uh, secular uh, uh, it's for the secular um also the sacredness of the human central to the concept of human rights finds its meaning in the abrahamic memory of the religions of the book in a jewish but above all christian interpretation of the neighbor 
that is the fellow man. The idea that secular morality is a unique contribution of the West to the non-Western world is unacceptable in the light of glaring contrary evidence. A quick look at the examples of the Chinese and the Indian traditions is sufficient to throw serious doubts on its validity. Take the Dharmic tradition. There are of course multiple versions and interpretations of this tradition. But one of the most plausible ways of looking at it is the suggestion that morality is not pre-given prior to human social life. The complex contingencies of human life are the springboard of its emergence. And in the course of the interplay of the moral and other regulatory principles, the moral acquires an authority that goes beyond its contingent origins. Take the Apastamma Sutra, Dharma Sutra, of the Dharma Sastras, uh, of the Dharma Sastras. And I quote, right and wrong, wrong, Dharma and Adharma do not go about saying, here we are. Nor do gods or centers, Gandharvas, say, this is right, this is wrong. Let us very, very briefly look at Manu's exposition of Dharma. As the poet Ramanujan says of Manu, I quote, one has only to read Manu after a bit of Kant to be struck by the former's extraordinary lack of universality. He seems to have no clear notion of universal human nature from which one can deduce ethical degrees. To be moral for Manu is to particularize, to ask who did it, to what and when. A denial of universal, that is unique human nature, is a summary rejection of the Abrahamic enlightenment uh, uh, universe, uh, 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 rejection of the Abrahamic enlightenment universal humanity. And to particularize is to place morality firmly in the domain of the mundane temporal world. There is of course for the greater part of traditional Indian philosophical thought, the world beyond the transient world of humans and other beings, the eternal never changing world of the liberated soul, naturally free from the volatilities of the moral life. And this latter is firmly rooted in the contingencies of life in this world. Dharma is the regulator of human life through its very sensitive and ever, sur ever sensitive subtle particularities. It is because Dharma is context sensitive in this way that it can legitimately apply to the most intransigent of human conditions. Take for uh, this, um, uh, these intransigent human conditions or extreme conditions, apada, the apada dharma, the dharma of extremities. Take for example, it is no violation of dharma if an elder brother who is physically incapable of taking part in procreation requests his younger brother to help in the wife's conception of a possible heir. Of course, with the consent of the wife. Sanatan Dharma is the set of ethically regulatory principles that have come down to us from ancient times, which have been culled from ancient texts like Upanishads, Vedas, Puranas, and the Gita, and the epics of Ramayana and Mahabharata. And most importantly, reflection on the great variety of subtleties of human experience through time. Sanatan Dharma consists of general principles of action, but they are subject to modifications and changes in the light of the dharma of the time, yuga dharma and situation. Neither monotheistic authoritarian universality nor the reason of enlightenment, but it is these generalities of sanatana dharma which, give, which guide man in his or her search for the good, fulfilling life in this one. Now, I would like to just an aside on monotheism. Um, um, I'm not a monotheist. If monotheism, this is a quote, quote from the famous uh, German philosopher Nietzsche. 
and I agree with Nietzsche on many of the things that he has to say. Monotheism hammers at human consciousness, demanding that it transcend itself, that it reach out into a light of understanding so pure that it is itself blinding. In polytheism, Nietzsche says, lay the freedom of the human spirit, its creativity and multiplicity. The doctrine of a single deity whom man can play off against other gods and thus wins open spaces for their, for their own aims is the most monstrous of all human errors. I read it again. The doctrine of a single deity whom man can, uh, who, uh, whom man cannot play off against other gods and thus wins open spaces for their own aim is the most monstrous of all human errors. This is Gandhi uses the deep and subtle, supple Indian tradition of ethical thinking. The central moral ideas of this tradition are ahimsa, satyagraha, love, surrender of the sovereignty of the self, being as opposed to just human being, injustice between two and three, fearless and the gift of fearlessness. All these ideas are interconnected in multiple ways and Gandhi's use of them is extraordinarily inventive and original. I shall touch upon only some of Gandhian ideas which are profoundly opposed to the Western tradition of theological ethics of Abrahamic foundation and its modern secular transformation. The casting of Christianity as the world religion per excellence the supreme ethical religion professing the intention of ethical conquest of the world was extraordinarily strange to Gandhi. According to the retrospective account provided in the autobiography of Gandhi and elsewhere as well, in his youth, listening to the missionaries, I quote, stand in a corner near the high school and hold forth pouring abuse on Hindus and their gods. He comes to be convinced about the equality of all religions, except Christianity, which because of its intolerance could not be equal to Indian religions. Gandhi's attitude to Christianity softened a great deal through the course of his life, but he remained firm in his view that no religion can legitimately claim supremacy over other religions. Secondly, all religions deserve equal respect. There is no hierarchy of religions. The Hindu tradition, much older than the Christian, has always allowed the possibility of the ethical life without a faith in God, the one supreme God, and his miracles and interventions in this world. Gandhi was a firm believer in this tradition. Think of Gandhi on atheism. Gandhi said, atheist can be as moral as a theist. How could he have said this if he believed that there couldn't be a secular morality? Uh, think of Gandhi on atheism and his favorite bhajan, Vaishnava Janatu, a rendition of which on the flute we just heard uh, from uh, his name. Um, Vaishnava Janatu is a song in praise of qualities of mind which are ethically and spiritually liberating. A person who has developed these qualities of mind is known as a devotee of Vishnu. But the qualities are self-luminous and autonomous. Their self-luminosity and autonomy are not dependent on a prior faith in Vishnu. Their qualities, as are expressed in empathy for those who are suffering, uh, help without a sense of pride and self-satisfaction. For those in need, respect and tolerance for all beings of the world, to tell you without a sense of disdain for any, firmness in speech and deed, freedom from craving, respect for all women, truthfulness in their entire being, 
total disinterest in the wealth of others, non-attachment to worldly possessions and false distractions, fondness for the name of Rama, the best of humans. Rama is the best of humans. Uh, um, devoid of greed, deceit, lust, and anger. The virtues of such a person liberates his entire lineage. A tradition that can give rise to a song or a hymn, such as Vaishnava Janato, has the notion of a secular morality embedded in it and does not have to borrow it from an alien tradition. Gandhi believed that the large parts of all religions of the world are temporal and therefore are subject to change, um, uh, subject to change and are subject to historical cultural contingencies. They are what may be called the grounded faith held in place by performative continuity. But like all grounded belief, they are subject to change. Um, but Gandhi also believed in a religion that resides in all religions. This religion is groundless, ungrounded, and is constituted by daya or prayer. Gandhi uses these words interchangeably and translates them as compassion, pity, or love. Satyagraha is frequently equated with daya dharma. It is ungrounded because it is beyond the realm of reason and yogas. The final response of the satyagri to the question, why satyagraha, is silence. For satyagraha requires the relinquishing of the sovereignty of the self. Devoid of the sovereignty of the self, there can be no reason and no knowledge. It is self is the source of reason and knowledge in the enlightenment, is in the enlightenment sense. And that organizes this, this, uh, that decision. It requires faith and silence. It requires faith and silence. Silence is conceived as a tripartite scheme. Dumbness, that's one. Speech, that's another. And silence, that's the third. Satyagraha belongs not to speech, the zone of reason and logos, but to dumbness, nor to dumbness, the subaltern soundlessness, but to silence. The, so Satyagraha doesn't belong to, uh, 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 it doesn't belong to speech, the, it, it doesn't belong to zone of reason, the logos, but not to dumbness, but dumbness of the subaltern soundlessness, but to silence. A zone that comes only as a withdrawal which is also to say a traversal both of speech and dumbness. A secular morality belongs to the domain of speech. The satagrahi both affirms the speech and bursts forth into silence. Religion that resides in all religions requires the si this silence. Faith belongs to the zone of silence. Wittgenstein said, whereof one cannot speak, there are one must be silent. Then ahimsa, as it is involved in religion, in the religion that stays in all religions, must guide action, not just towards all human beings, but to all beings of the world, and particularly to all living beings. But ahimsa is, a never, uh, is never an easy option. Gandhi said, violence and killing done by warriors is preferable to the non-violence of those who are afraid to die. I want both Hindus and Muslims to cultivate the cool courage to die without killing. But if one has not, not courage, one has not that courage, I want him to cultivate the art of killing. And being killed rather than in a cowardly manner flee from the danger. But the latter, in spite of his flight, commits mental himself. He flees because he has not the courage to be killed in the act of killing. Also, turning the other cheek, which Gandhi calls the royal road of turning the other cheek, cannot be ruled to be always followed. To do so would make it a blind fetish. There is, no, there is too the problem of residual cleaning, uh, sorry, killing in everyday life the inevitable violence, the unavoidable, unavoidable violence of eating and drinking, 
that not even the most rigorous practitioner of non-killing can break down, can break from. Unlike the violence implicated in the necessary courage required by the practitioner of Ahimsa, the violence is not within the ambit of the principle, this violence is not within the ambit of the principles of Ahimsa, is external to Ahimsa, uh, because one never completely renounces the will to live. Aware of this residual killing, Gandhi describes Ahimsa by analogy to the Euclidean line of point a high ideal striven for, but never achieved. Another concept that is part of the cluster of concepts that constitutes the moral, according to Gandhi, is the idea of self-sacrifice. Other ideas intimately related to it are surrendering the autonomy of the self, relinquishing the sovereignty of the self, the pure gift of fearlessness, abhaidhan. The third is possible, that is, avaidan is possible only on the basis of the achievement of the first two, surrendering the autonomy of the self, relinquishing the sovereignty of the self. Um, uh, the gift of fearlessness is not possible unless you have relinquished these two first. This third, uh, the distinguished French sociologist, Marcel Mauss, some time ago, in the early 90s, uh, early, uh, 20th century, uh, he wrote this very famous book called The Gift, uh, which has the subtitle Forms and Functions of Exchange in Archaic Societies. Famously argued that gift is a form of exchange between individuals, an individual and a group or between groups of individuals. The giver makes the gift in actual exchange or in anticipation of an exchange from the recipient. The return may be in kind or a commitment to a mode of relationship such as domination, subordination, honor, and respect, e.g. the royal feast to the populace. But to reduce the gift to a mode of exchange is to turn it into an instrumentality and to render the idea of a non-instrumental, what Gandhi called pure gift, vacuous, that is deconstructed. The gift of fearlessness, on the other hand, is unintelligible as a pure gift. It can never be given in expectation of a return gift from the recipient. To trade fearlessness with something from the recipient is to denude the idea of fearlessness of any significance. For there would be a huge element of fear left in the giver. For instance, what would the return gift be like and would it come at all? Such a supposed gift of fearlessness would therefore be an instance of self-deception and thus not a genuine gift of fearlessness at all. This gift must be coever, coever with the relinquishment of the sovereignty of the Gandhi also reminds us that it only needs a small extension of the idea to see that self-sacrifice is not limited to humans. The sacrifice of the seed involved in the birth of the plant, the sacrifice of animals to protect their young and so on. The child, I quote Gandhi, the child lives only because the mother suffers for it, even to the point of death. The corn grows only when the seed dies. This of course is subject to the objection that science has abundantly proved that behavior of animals other than humans and of vegetative life is capable of being explained, um, is capable of being fully explained without any residue of explicando in genetic, that is physical terms. The so-called self-sacrifice of animals, plants is a purely metaphorical extension of language. It belongs properly only to the complex ways in which we meaningfully talk about our mind and self. I have argued in some detail in another paper of mine, which will be shortly published, only uh, why this view is unacceptable. This view that animal behavior is totally, completely translatable into, reducible to um, um, the activities of genes or activities 
of physical items in the world. Here, I would simply like to suggest that Um, the West's unwavering reluctance, I made this point already, unwavering reluctance to include animals within the domain of ethics is part of the continuing tradition of Abrahamic, non Abrahamic monotheism and enlightenment universalism of reason. The inability of the West so to see beyond the human center, or should we say person center, because ethics is uh, kind of, uh, for most Western thinkers and modern philosophy, ethics is really limited to interpersonal relationship or within the person self, self, person's relationship to himself. But this must be again related to interpersonal relationship. Ethics is, in gray, human centered, or should I say, person centered ethics, which is ingrained in monotheistic frame of thinking that the West is willingly rooted in. Lastly, a word about Gandhi's rejection of what he called modern civilization or modern civility. To desire endlessly is man's natural impulse, modernity is man. Civility civility consists in making necessarily incalculable attempts at managing and organizing man's desires in such a way as to devise and invent ever new means to achieve the satisfaction of infinitely numerous human desires. Politics, economics, structural violence, and there is violence that is internal to government, police force. Uh, the uh, armed forces and so on. Politics, economic, structural violence, information, information missionary of the sovereign state, the knowledge industry and the international diplomacy are all placed in the service of this primary motivation of modern civility. This pursuit of the infinite in terms of the finite is necessarily impossible. Infinite desires, pursuit of infinite desires. Uh, so this pursuit of the infinite in terms of the finite is necessarily impossible. But engagement in this impossible pursuit generates in Gandhi's work an incredible intoxication. That is also his work. So Gandhi says, I quote, those who are intoxicated by modern civility or civilization are not likely to write against, uh, write against it. Their care will be to find out facts and arguments in support of it. And it is not even as though they do this consciously. They themselves believe <coughs> what they write. A man seized by sleep believes in the dreams that come to him. When, his sleep, when, his, when the sleep flies away, only then does he realize his own mistake. The same is the situation of a man seized by civilization. Their writings hypnotize us and also <coughs> one by one, <coughs> excuse me, we are drawn into this vortex. That's from Hinsuraj. Gandhi's diagnosis of the disease of modern civilization, civility, may sound quite as heady as the disease itself. But his insight, I think, is invaluable for a critical reflection on our times. We must also remember that Gandhi wrote Hinswaras in 1910, and modernity seems to have treaded the path <coughs> exactly as Gandhi's diagnosis would have led us to believe. I'd like to end by making a speculative point about how Gandhi would have answered a reader's question, as Hinswaras, reader and the editor. I would like to end by making a speculative point about how Gandhi would have answered a reader's questions about how to understand the idea of a totally liberated soul. A totally liberated soul merges into the Paramatma and is necessarily beyond the world of space and time, and therefore beyond the karma bhumi of the Satagre. Paramatma is characterized by three qualities, Sat, Chit, and Anand. Truth or, truth or reality or existence, that is 
Sat, Consciousness, Chit, and Joy, Ananda. <coughs> Paramatma is beyond Maya. <coughs> it cannot therefore be illusory. It is real. Sat, it must have consciousness, but its consciousness must be atemporal and beyond the bounds of space. Eternal, beyond the bounds of space. Lastly, it must be ananda, because it is free from the miseries and sufferings <coughs> of this world. <coughs> but can we even say this much about the Paramatma? And mustn't we be silent whereof we cannot speak? Is there even an analogy whereby one can perhaps get a glimpse, illegitimate as it might be, of what being immersed in the Paramatma could be like? Maybe there is. Let us listen to what one of the most distinguished postmodern fiction writers, Milan Kundera, has to say about ecstasy. Ecstasy means being outside oneself, as indicated by the etymology of the Greek word. The act of leaving one's position, stasis, like a dreamer escaping into the past or the future, just the opposite, um, just the opposite. Ecstasy is absolute identity with the present instant, with the present instant and total forgetting of past and future. If we obliterate the future and the past, the present moment stands in empty space, outside life and its chronology, outside time and independent of it. This is why it can be linked to eternity, which too is the, is the negation of time. But this is also interesting. We're used to connecting the notion of ecstasy to great mystical moments. But there is such a thing as everyday, ordinary, vulgar ecstasy. The ecstasy of anger, ecstasy of speed at the whip, the ex ecstasy of ear-splitting noise, ecstasy in the soccer stadium. Living is a perpetual, heavy effort not to lose sight of ourselves, to stay solidly present in ourselves, in our stasis. Step outside ourselves for a mere instant and we verge on death's dominion. So this is Kundera. This account of ecstasy, if we accept it, at least makes it possible for us to imagine timeless, sat, chit, and anna. But of course, the timelessness of ecstasy is within time, the temporal framework, while the timeless of the sat, chit, anan is totally independent of time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Mayamiri, sir, for your insightful, thought-provoking, and magnificent speech. Hope uh, all of us, partially present here, have enjoyed a lot. So once again, thank you so much, Professor Mayamiri, sir. Now, I would like to invite Professor P.R. Bhot, sir, to deliver the second lecture. He will speak on a very interesting issue that is the notion of necessity in philosophy, logical, scientific, and metaphysical. Uh, before handing over this session to Professor P.R. Bhatsar, I would like to briefly introduce Professor P.R. Bhatsar. Dr. Parameshwar Ramavat did his graduation and post-graduation in philosophy from Karnatok University, Harwat. He did his PhD from IIT Kanpur in January 1980 and joined IIT Bombay as a lecturer. He became head in 2001 and completed his term in 2004. He retired in 2016 as professor and continued as emeritus fellow till June 2019. He taught several philosophy courses to undergraduate and postgraduate students and supervised 11 PhD students. He has authored about 50 research papers and presented seminars nationally and internationally. He has jointly authored two books, Psychoanalysis as a Human Science, Beyond Foundationalism, and in defense of liberal 
religion. He served as member of several expert committees in philosophy. He was a member of ICPR Council for two terms. May I now request Professor Bhatsar to deliver his speech. Sir, please. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Okay, that's nice. Uh, good morning to everyone. Professor Vice Chancellor and Professor Manan Mary, Professor Shan Kishore Singh, Professor Robert John Clamor, and Dr. Bhaskar Bhattacharya, and all the learned audience members, and ladies and gentlemen. This is a topic which has been discussed philosophically by many thinkers, both Western and Indian. I would like to therefore present sample positions of people who are logicians and scientists and scientifically oriented philosophers. They may be called philosophers of science and metaphysicians. All of them showed keen interest in trying to find knowledge which is indubitable, which cannot be doubted, which cannot be, you know, changed because of time or other factors, which will always remain true. Therefore, we might call it absolute truth. Philosophers were trying to find such knowledge which can be made foundation of other knowledge and so on. That was the attempt of through human civilization. And I would be talking from three perspectives and trying to find some ground which, if possible, to work out, find absolute objectivity of knowledge. So, logician, scientific approach to knowledge and metaphysical approach to knowledge. All three I will be discussing one by one. Now, in logic, we do talk about loss of thought and loss of thought are said to be basically three law of identity. What it says is A is A or everything is what it is and law of excluded middle, either something is the case or it is not the case or law of contradiction, both P and not P cannot be true together. So if somebody is a living human being, he can't be a dead human being. So there could be many examples of that kind. So these three fundamental laws of thought are said to be true and known to be true intuitively. We cannot think of any rational way of arguing, debating, or even developing a language without following these three principles. And there are critics who point out to us that this loss of thought are loss of thought because we made them to be so. In other words, we think in a particular manner and we also do not allow others to, you know, say certain things like, I am very happy, but today I am very miserable. You cannot say that you are happy as well as miserable. Though, Sometimes we might be in that kind of situation where there is a good news because of which you are happy and something wrong has happened and therefore you are miserable. Both emotion could be mixed emotion 
such a situation can arise but logicians say that you cannot contradict yourself you cannot assert opposite things or you cannot say p as well as not p and so on so logic has been in the hands of many thinkers at a value of a certain kind which you have to abide by so in a way by implementing rigorously logic we have made a logic absolute this is what many people try to point out critics especially they said for example what you said said law of identity is something may be said to be true everything is what it is yes a is a yes but what do you get out of it no knowledge advancement so that's what he says there is no statement perhaps which is more useless than this law of identity then there are others who say that well law of excluded middle that is something is either the case or it is not the case this also depends on certain kind of situation you cannot say that you know for instance a bachelor's wife is either sick or healthy you cannot be saying this because a bachelor cannot have a wife if he has a wife he is not a bachelor so something of this kind is not possible that one law of excluded middle can apply only in the domain where p valued logic operates either someone is male or not male so when you say this at a certain level yes it is true at a certain other level if you not male if you take as female then it is not true because there is the third gender as well today we do recognize the third gender so like this there are problems even with loss of thought we do not permit people to argue and discuss in with three valued four valued or five valued or multi valued logic and in those cases the whole perspective changes and loss of thought changes or they don't they won't be applicable in those contexts and then let us talk about law of contradiction is law of contradiction valid at least sometimes we do say for example in sankhya philosophy we say that prakriti is not conscious purusha is conscious sankhya is a dualist uh, sankhya philosophy is dualism and it maintains that there are two fundamental realities which are prakriti and purusha but in the evolution when evolution takes place it is the prakriti which imitates the purusha and behaves as if it is conscious so who do say that such a thing prakriti evolution of prakriti which is conscious as well as not conscious that cannot be the case however you know in the liberated state all that happens is that the purusha which confuses itself with the prakriti will know that purusha is purusha prakriti is different from purusha that is the state of liberation so again law of contradiction is denied when prakriti thinks that it is purusha or it is conscious so i move on to the second you know uh, this is this is by scientists who try to maintain that laws of nature are absolute they have no exceptions they have they are always true and in any possible world any kind of country you think of any area 
or any planet you think of you know the for example the gravitational law that applies to this world planet it also applies to moon it also applies to mars and so on so this law which is universal in every sense of the term wherever there is mass or wherever there is matter there will be attraction there will be you know gravitational force operating so scientists quite a few scientists have tried to claim that laws of nature are absolute they are always true they do not change according to time reason or according to you know the uh, other temperature or you know variables the the environment doesn't change them of course certain laws may not be applicable scientists believe that yet we might be able to discover some more laws which are unknown to us they are of course operating but we are unaware of them so such situations do exist and we do add more and more laws and as we expand in science in biology biotechnology nanotechnology you know subatomic realm or in the very heavenly and vast universe there could be laws which we are unaware of we do observe certain things galaxies and some of the galaxies do vanish maybe as some stars die we don't understand how can they die what it means and so on there might be other laws even when the earth temperature is aging and it comes to such a level where no living being exists then certain new laws might emerge and nobody might be there to observe them so any law of this kind also will be universal truth it is only we are ignorant about them this is the kind of view which was being pushed by you know scientists like newton and also thinkers like popper and others so the critics of science science for example you know the mills talked about his methods of arriving at you know the generalizations and his critics pointed out that he confused correlation with that of you know causation and so on so and you know later on the present day or the 20th century thinkers like kuhn and farban tried to point out that there is lot of things in precise things and economic factors cultural factors and philosophical factors and our mode of thinking or history of our civilization and so on do influence our science do influence our decision towards what is the best research or who should be awarded nobel prize and so on so all these things and kuhn historically pointed out that how paradigm shift takes place shift takes place and how other factors play there into the hands of thinkers or scientists and so on so net result is they also try to shake up the view that there is absolute knowledge of laws of nature or there is absolute truth about science so relativism or some kind of fashion uh, that operates in certain centuries and so on and then we have another thinker who tried to make revolutionize our epistemic approach to knowledge uh, this is uh, emmanuel kant german philosopher his philosophy is 
considered to be Copernican revolution. Earlier philosophers, empiricists, and others thought that the knowledge comes through sense experience or from reason. We develop our concepts and then, of course, describe reality and so on. Kant tried to point out that, sorry, that doesn't seem to be the case. You know, in Copernican Revolution, what had happened was that earlier view that sun was around the earth was reversed and earth was going around the sun was upheld with arguments, of course, and observations and so on. And here Kant said, knowledge is not coming through sense experience so innocently. We have concepts. He called them categories of judgment. And there are several categories that are pre-given to us. Our mind thinks of them automatically. For example, cause and effect relationship is not learned through sense experience according to him and it is cause as well as effect these are two concepts interconnected and you cannot think of only cause if you think of a cause you have to think of an effect and if you think of an effect you have to think of its cause so he has used some of the what he calls antinomies to prove certain things that they are, you know, for example, time has a beginning and time doesn't have a beginning or it is infinite. Both the things can be proved rationally and of course both cannot be true. Therefore, he said, time is an intuition. Intuition has a separate, uh, you know, uh, place and space and time are said to be intuitions and they come into existence when you perceive an object, for example, or imagine an object. You have to imagine an object in certain space and at a certain period of time. Similarly, perception also, observation also, and so on. These are separate, but categories like, you know, the uh, modalities and uh, the assertion, negation, etc., all these things you are born with and you will apply to the world in making judgments or in understanding. So that there has to be some kind of synthesis that is something that comes through your sense perception, sense organs, certain categories are supplied by mind, a synthesis state takes place and you get the knowledge about the world. So Kant talked about you know, important other things like a priori, a posteriori. A, pri a priori is prior to experience. A posteriori is after experience. And he also talked about analytic and synthetic. And analytic is where there is no new knowledge. It will be the predicate which contained in the subject. That is the way he will define it, of course and it may not be acceptable to all. People do modify this definition. And in the <coughs> synthetic statement, predicate gives you new knowledge. So sense experience is both synthetic as well as a posterior, right? And mathematical theorems and logical theorems, etc., are known a priori or known rationally. There is no sense organ involved, but he talked about third category, synthetic a priori. That there are synthetic a priori judgments. These, of course, geometry, for example, is both necessary or a priori, as well as it is, in some sense, geometrical figures can be drawn. Geometry itself is science. In some way, you get new knowledge. So, Kant tried to say that all laws of nature are synthetic a priori. They are necessary as well as they give you new knowledge. So, later on, logical positivists who formed Kantian 
categories of this kind as unnecessary duplication. They said all analytical statements are a priori, they are linguistic truth because of the very meaning of the words involved, you'll be able to say that a bachelor is unmarried male, for example. Uh, this you need not have to verify and so on. And there are other statements which are only synthetic. They are observational statements and they can be known through sense experience and also one can verify them and so on. So these are only two kinds of you know, judgments are possible. One is a prior or another is a posterior or one is analytic, the other one is synthetic. So they try to find fault with uh, Kant and they also, of course, found that metaphysicians who are trying to build grand systems and so on have the pseudo structure of a description, but they are neither true nor false. Of course, metaphysicians held them to be true, and some of them are said to be necessary. All those truths which are true in all possible worlds are said to be necessary, and logical positivists try to maintain that if you call them necessary, either you are talking about only, you know, a prior statements or logical theorems which are true in all possible worlds because of the very notations, the manner in which you give meaning to those statements, like either something is P or not P. So, in such situations, they are always true given the definition of the symbol either or. So, either it is a theorem of that kind, which is theoretically true in all possible worlds because of the very meaning, or there is no possible world which is different from this actual world. So, possible world is a fiction of imagination of, you know, philosophers, metaphysicians, they talk about necessity, but even that necessity either is of mathematical kind or logical kind. Otherwise, all that you can do is to, like you, generalize empirical observation, talk in terms of probability, maybe very likely that tomorrow sun will rise. You cannot talk about necessity at all, or if you are aware of the planetary movement, this and that, then you can say day and night, of course it is day here, somewhere else it is night, and earth moves along with its axis, also moves along the sun, because of its tiltedness we have day and night, and also we have, you know, the seasons of the year and so on. So either you will explain in terms of wider scope or you will be saying that these things are causally connected. The day is causing the night, night is causing the day. All this is illusion if you understand the planetary behavior and so on. So when this kind of logical positivists were pushing that metaphysics is useless, it is not talking about the world, there is no knowledge possible, there is no truth condition or it cannot be true or false. When this was being made and Kripke, a uh, modern philosopher, tried to revive metaphysics, he tried to maintain that, you know, that a priori, a posterior are epistemic distinctions, analytical, synthetic, are, you know, linguistic distinctions, contingency and necessity are metaphysical distinctions. He tried to clear the confusion and try to maintain that there are necessary metaphysical statements. In order to show that, 
he invoked the concept of rigid designators and proper names and natural kind terms natural kind terms you know the water trees stone all these are named found in nature and they are said to be common names and they add proper names we give names to certain things and persons and so on all of them are rigid designators he coined a new expression rigid designators what it means is once you name a person that person is named or that name can be used even after his death he may not be there yet we are going to use his name but is total for example is not there all of us have learned the name of aristotle we know who may refer to and so on so these are said to be rigid designators once you name proper name you use proper name it will refer to the same person and even when you conceive of him in a possible world you are rigidly referring to that person if he exists over there in your history book if he exists obviously it refers to him so all the names and uh, you know common names are said to be uh, all the natural kinds are said to be rigid designators by him and he made a claim that identity statement between rigid designators if empirically discovered to be true in the actual world they will be true in all possible worlds where those objects designated things exist so he made this claim and also pointed out that when we baptize we have observational statements this child i name it as x when i name it and that you know, that is enough that people do continue to use that proper name here after whether we are able to meet that child that child becomes adolescent and adult and so on you may not meet him again yet you may be able to my friend's son he so and so etc you can talk about him and so on so forth so if by chance he has a nickname his parents call him by some nickname and you learn that that nickname is the same name of x then you know that this identity x is y and if such an identity statement you know that it is true then in all possible worlds wherever that person is existing this identity statement will be true so thus he tried to maintain that morning star is evening star is a great discovery in science in astronomy and you have learned some of that morning star evening star it is the same venus which appears in the morning which appears in the evening this knowledge has given you something very important necessary truth and metaphysics at least he has proved one metaphysical statement to be necessary and then of course he extends his thesis for that um, you know he says gold is having valency 79 of course modern scientists do not use that so like this one could uh, you know extend much more and show that metaphysical necessary truths are possible however critics of uh, you know kripke including myself we find that this is at a certain level a kind of language we constructed in such a way that by definition it has to be necessary identity statement if it is continuously known to be true it becomes necessary because we make use of you know possible world talk you know uh, the patnam follower of uh, kripke on this matter that is about rigid designator and so on see maintains 
that there can be physical necessity in the actual world, but in a possible world it may not be there because including loss of nature you can conceive of a possible world where gravitational force doesn't work the way it works in the actual world. So maybe the things go you know, as if uh, uh, you know, you, human beings can flow where there is no gravitational pull at all when you are traveling from earth to moon for example. That is an area where the uh, you know, attraction towards Earth as well as towards Moon is neutralized. So you have no weight at all, you don't move at all. So like this, there can be an area where gravitational force doesn't act at all. So in such situation, you know, you can talk about law of gravitation doesn't work. So Patnan tried to maintain that, including scientific laws, possible world can be imagined. But if in a, you know, Kripke himself has talked about possible world as, you know, to simplify it, he tried to say it is a counterfactual world or it is a competing account of the same world. We are not talking about a possible world distant planet. So he tried to say that it is a counter, uh, another account. If it is another account of the same world, this world of course has loss of nature and it will continue to have it and there cannot be, like Putnam thought, a possible world where there is no gravitational force not working. So thus, we will realize that a metaphysical statement is true if and only if it is true in all possible worlds where all possible world has to be understood as all plausible worlds. That is where all laws of nature are operable and they are applicable. If that is the case, then the uh, Patnam's position is wrong where metaphysical truths will merge with all the scientific laws and Kant's synthetic a priori judgments will be applicable to such metaphysical statements and everyone, everything will be at this level absolute and true. But the grand metaphysicians or quite a few religious thinkers, you know, talk, talk about liberation or transcendental reality, self after death is transcendental. It goes to heaven or liberation, whatever, whatever. Those are absolute truths. Sachidananda was mentioned and Sachidananda is a state which is not in space and time, which is not phenomenal reality at all. Let me conclude by saying that all these perspectives might give you a notion of what is absolute truth but they seem to fail at a certain level because what we are searching for is absolute truth in the phenomenal world. We are not seeking for absolute truth after we die or after we, if at all there is any liberation and a state of moksha and so on. So we are looking for the absolute truth in the phenomenal world. Kant could give this and even the possible world, Kripke in some sense could give it, give at least some examples and that could be same as metaphysical truth as well as truth in science and unconditional truth. They are not conditioned to Therefore, we have in some cases necessary truth, they can be contrasted with, of course, contingent truth, a property of, you know, a fruit may be green now, later on it might become yellow, and still further if you keep it, it might become black and so on. These are contingent properties, necessary truths, only law of nature can provide 
and some of these laws of identity etc could be applicable to reality and therefore laws of thought is laws of nature as well and laws of reality as well if we take identity cases but the other two may not be applicable so thus let me give an example if i have a tooth ache i go to the doctor and complain that about my tooth and it is paining he might remove the suggest that he will remove the tooth i will be relieved of my pain and again after some time i go to the same doctor complaining about another tooth he says no sorry it, this is also decayed it has to be removed then i ask him doctor is there no solution to all my tooth ache he says yes there is a solution remove all the teeth and you will have wear venture you will be free from tooth ache but then that is what i don't want i want to retain tooth enjoy the fruits of having good teeth but you know if that is removed and i wear denture so much of advantage i have lost and denture cannot compete with the genuine tooth so i would say that we are looking for absolute truth and phenomenal meaning that right within space and time and we could find such a thing in kant we could find such a thing in kripke we could find a natural laws which are absolute the window time might be there but it will appear as one of the variables but not within time so all laws of nature are such things and they give absolute truth i conclude here thank you very much for listening to this lecture i thank the organizers for giving me this chance to share my views thank you uh, thank you so much uh, professor tr bachar for your remarkable thought provoking and wonderful speech on the notion of necessity in philosophy logical scientific and metaphysical so once again thank you so much professor p r bachar so there is an announcement i would like to request participants friends to send your queries and observations in your chat box which will be discussed in the interactive session now i uh, proceed to the last lecture that will be uh, delivered by professor syam kishor singh sir sir will speak on creativity in the domain of art and aesthetics uh professor singh sir has taught philosophy at guwahati university and manipur university he retired as professor head of philosophy department in manipur university his areas of studies are logic analytical philosophy and aesthetics he was associated with the project of history of indian science philosophy and culture sponsored by the gov of india as an editor he was also a senior fellow of the indian council of philosophical research new delhi professor singh was accorded honor as the general president of the 88th session of the indian philosophical congress held at madurai tamil nadu in december 2014 may i now call upon professor shankishor singh sir to deliver his speech on creativity in the domain of art and aesthetics sir please dr bhaskar bhattacharya professor meri professor bhat and uh, all the participants i would like to thank the organizers especially askar for inviting me to participate in this important panel discussion 
Today, I will speak on the topic creativity in the domain of art and aesthetics. Creativity is an abstract term and uh, as such, it is difficult to give a precise definition of this term. However, all of us know that creativity is derived from the word creation, which in the ordinary language means making something. We all know that uh, creativity is involved in every human enterprise. So we may say that creativity is a unique human capability to make innovations in many of our enterprises, such as science, technology, management, and discoveries, inventions, and the literature and the arts, as well as in philosophy. So creativity is involved in all of our activities, although each one of us is equally is not equally endowed with the creative activity, although we are potentially uh, capable of being creative and make, uh, make great discoveries or great inventions or become great uh, creators in the field of research, arts, so on and so forth. An eminent English writer, Perhaps uh, you are familiar with him, he's a great novelist. So, Arthur Kessler, in his uh, uh, famous book, Act of Creation, which was published in London in 1959, has maintained that creativity is involved in all human pursuits making great scientific discoveries, inventions, and in making uh, inventions in the field of medicine or uh, in the field of mathematics or in any other fields, including art, etc. So it is involved. And uh, without creativity, it is, uh, so to say, not at all possible to make all these great innovations and discoveries. And he has also maintained that the act of creation, the, title, the very title of his book is also the act of creation. And he says that uh, in every enterprise, in every innovative enterprises, the act of creation is more or less similar. I'm not uh, entering into details of what he has said. It's a very voluminous book. So that way, creativity is involved in great uh, discoveries and uh, creations. And you must also be aware, as students of philosophy, that uh, Bertrand Russell, in his uh, book, History of Western Philosophy, page 138, has made a very interesting remark about his own experience about creation and creativity. He himself was a great creator, not only in the field of mathematics and philosophy, but in the field of literature also. And you must be very well aware that he was awarded Nobel Prize for literature. So, from his experience, he said that everyone who is engaged in such serious enterprises, whether in the field of researches in science, mathematics, or philosophy, or in arts, so 
there is a moment, there is a special moment uh, in which one is deeply concentrated and engaged in the pursuit of the thing. And uh, in, the, in the pursuit, uh, one has undergone great travels. So there are suspense, moments of suspense, but ultimately at the end of the uh, road, so the truth comes uh, out and uh, it's a moment of great joy. So everybody will uh, experience it, whoever has uh, dwelt on any serious sacrifice. He has made this remark, so from his point of view also, creativity is very much essential in every serious humanity. And so in this, uh, uh, so to say, talk, in this discussion, I will dwell on uh, the, on, on creativity in the field of art and aesthetics, because I cannot dwell on uh, all the things, but I will focus on art and aesthetics. And uh, you know that, so, originally, artist is regarded as a maker. Artist, the artist is a, is a creator, is a maker. And uh, the creation of the artist is very often compared by analogy to the making of uh, the world by, by God. And uh, there, there is another sense. So in that way, the artist is a maker, he is a creator. So there is another sense of creation according to which being creative means the generation of new ideas. Creation in this sense is equivalent to being imaginative. So the artist uh, is a person who is uh, uh, quite imaginative especially those uh, artists who uh, write uh, very good, beautiful poems, those artists, so who has uh, who are the painters, for example, the artists so in those areas. So they are mainly imaginative. And uh, so uh, artistic creation, so uh, in this sense, are the creations of those who are quite imaginative, who are capable of making innovations and uh, create something new. So this is uh, one sense of uh, creation by the artist. So their creation in this sense is equivalent to being imaginative. So artistic creation may be used in another sense also. So in this sense, so it means uh, innovativeness, being innovative. So this is a, a point which I would, would like to say in the outset. So it may be mentioned that art activity is characterized by three features. They are creative activity of the artist. Secondly, the work of art, the production of the work of art. And uh, thirdly, uh, the response to the work of art from the audience. So these are the three main features, which are uh, three main elements, so to say, which are involved in the uh, activity of the creation of art. Art work, cre uh, creation of artwork is uh, a great enterprise. So, and uh, in this respect, these three elements are involved because the artist creates something, uh, but uh, although he may or may not have the, uh, the inten intention of uh, making his art uh, known to others or that uh, his uh, poem be read by others or not, so that is a different thing. But so whenever uh, a poem is written by a poet, great poet, say by uh, William Wordsworth. So all of us uh, read that poem and the way of this. So from that point of view, the poem which the poet Wordsworth has written, so that is enjoyed by us, by us the responsive uh, audience. So from that point of view, this 
aspect of the audience response is also involved. So now we find that, so far as art, importance of art is concerned, it is a fact that the sense of beauty, aesthetic satisfaction, or the joy felt at the perception of beautiful objects, whether of nature or of artistic uh, creation, uh, and then the appreciation of creative artwork. So these are remarkable experiences of mankind. The very fact that man has devoted so much time and energy in the production of artworks and uh, in the appreciation and criticism of artwork, writing volumes of critical uh, works. So from all these uh, texts, we find that art activity is a very important human activity which is associated with our culture and civilization. Now, aesthetics as a philosophical has raised certain fundamental questions about the nature of art, aesthetic attitude, aesthetic experience, creative imagination, aesthetic judgment, emotional response to art, criteria of appreciation, etc. So discussion on the nature of art and aesthetic experience occupy the normal business of traditional aesthetics. But the traditional writings on aesthetics have uh, met with criticism from several, from some directions, especially from two aspects, from two philosophical standpoints in the contemporary uh, period. One is uh, uh, from the standpoint of analytical uh, philosophers who have been influenced by the writings and later works of Ludwig Wittgenstein. So Wittgenstein, uh, in his letter writing, philosophical investigations, so uh, he has uh, uh, raised, because he did not uh, specifically raise the issue of art, but from what he had written about uh, use of language, family resemblance, uh, concepts, etc. From that point of view, a question has been seriously raised by some of the analytical thinkers in the field of aesthetics, such as uh, Maurice Weitz, um, uh, and uh, many. So they have uh, raised the point uh, whether art can be defined at all, whether uh, we can work out a family resemblance term about artwork and uh, the activities of the artwork, etc. So that uh, point has been raised from uh, by, by the analytical thinkers and uh, so far as the issues raised in, in the traditional Western aesthetics, so they have uh, raised certain skeptical points. So I am not entering into that. So another aspect, another area, uh, another standpoint, another standpoint uh, from which uh, criticisms have been raised against the traditional comes from the writings of um, Martin Heidegger and Gadamer and uh, the philosophers of the phenomenological and hermetic school. So particularly in the writings of Heidegger and Gadamer, we find uh, certain uh, questions which have been raised against the traditional concept of aesthetics the traditional concept of art, uh, nature and function of art, the meaning of uh, truth uh, in art. So in that area, questions have been raised against the traditional aesthetics by the philosophers of the phenomenological and hermetic uh, discipline. So I'm not entering into the 
details in this regard also. I am simply raising the, the point that, which, although most of us uh, dwell on uh, Western aesthetics, which starts from the writings of Plato, Aristotle, uh, down to Kant and Hegel, etc. So we build mainly on the topics, the issues which, have, which were raised by these philosophers uh, in ancient Greek times to the modern times. So, but uh, the uh, what I mean to say is that from these two uh, respects, namely from the the standpoint and uh, this hermetic uh, uh, thinking. So objections have been raised about the conception of artwork, about the function, about uh, issues raised about the creation and appreciation of art. So that much is uh, my point, which I want to uh, mention at this in, in this context. Uh, now, Creativity finds significant place in Western aesthetic tradition since the time of Plato and Aristotle. According to Plato, all creation or passage of non-being into being is poetry or making. The process, process of all art are creative and the masters of art are all poets or makers. This is Plato's opinion. So in Plato's uh, famous dialogue symposium, of course in Ion and Plato, etc., also he raised some aesthetic points uh, in the mouth of uh, his uh, few points were expressed uh, through the person of uh, Socrates. But uh, in, the, in the famous dialogue symposium, Plato had raised certain very important uh, issues in the field of art, about the creation of art, creativity, etc. Plato compared the creative act in art to the biological process of procreation. And he further claimed that both the uh, acts of creation uh, have, I mean, the, both the acts of creation means the create, creation of the artist and the creation of so in both uh, uh, activities of creation uh, so there is uh, one particular source and he called it the divine source that is the artist creation as well as the creation of uh, the world, both are both have divine origin. Aristotle also used the word creation in the sense of making or poesis. He has made a distinction between two of the things, which knowing, theory, doing, praxis, and the making, poesis. For him, poetic it is the productive art in general. Although there is a cultural gap between the Western and the Indian traditions, classical Indian literatures have lavishly compared the poetic creations to the creation of God. I refer to Plato and according to him, so the mm, creation of the creation of God. So in the Indian tradition also, although the Western tradition and the Indian traditions, so in between there is a long and a very wide cultural gap, but still we find a similarity of standpoint in this regard. So, so the, the analogy that has been given between art, this creation and the creation of it. In Kalidasa's, Kumar It's a beautiful description of the of love making of both Shiva and Parvati for the creation of the world. Now, just as the universe is created by Shiva and Parvati, the poet or the artist creates the work of art with the help of his creative imagination. 
So a, a technical term is used by the Indian uh, theoreticians, Indian uh, statisticians. So that term, they call Pratima. Pratima is genius or creative imagination. The creative process passes through the stages of conception, maturity, pain of travel, the ecstatic delight of artistic creation. The pleasure arising out of art experience or aesthetic experience is even compared to the blissful delight of what realization. The exponent of poetics and aesthetics in his magnum opus, Saita Darpana, has famously regarded the joy of poetic creation as the twin associate of attainment of Brahman, the ultimate self. Brahmananda Savodhar is the Sanskrit expression which he used. So in this context, I would like to mention that uh, Two goals or values of life raised by ancient seers, sages. So these two are Atmananda, which means spiritual bliss, and Dasanubhav, which means aesthetic enjoyment. So uh, according to the Asaryas of uh, Indian aesthetics, so these two uh, goals of human life are important. So one is the attainment of the ultimate goal of uh, the realization of the Atman. And uh, another goal, which is compared to the ultimate goal of spiritual bliss, is aesthetic enjoyment. According to the ancient Indian aestheticians, the experience of delight, ananda, arising out of artistic creation and its appreciation by the responsive audience is termed as rasa swadhana. So there is another technical term introduced by the Indian aestheticians. So they have used the term rasa swadhana. Rasa in the literal sense means taste. So it's one of us uh, have uh, yes, uh, the, the uh, flavor of uh, fruit. We enjoy the taste of delicacies, etc. So we interpret it as uh, enjoying rasa of the fruit. And uh, the term, this term, rasa swadhana, was uh, used by the Indian institutions in the place of the English expressing aesthetic experience, the enjoyment of the, uh, the enjoyment of the beauty of art. So that is Rasaswara. Now, Rasaswadana is a unique experience which is detached and self-abnegating, transcending the practical concerns of ordinary life in as much as it is absorbed in releasing the beauty of such art objects as poems, melodious music, dramatic performance, etc. Now, the Indian aestheticians maintain that in Rasaswadana, aesthetic experience, the attitude, the aesthetic, there is an aesthetic attitude of uh, detachment. So one forgets the practical activities of our mundane life, earthly life. So we forget it for the, for the moment and we remain completely immersed in the contemplation of the joy or bliss of aesthetic satisfaction. So enjoyment of rest. So this is a very important concept, very important uh, thought which uh, has been introduced Introduced by the aestheticians. In the part of my uh, talk, I will refer to 
the standpoint of Immanuel Kant, the German philosopher who also spoke on similar lines with regard to the aesthetic attitude experience. So this experience of Rasaswada is characterized by psychic process, which is technically termed Sadharani Krita, which means generality or detachment in the Indian aesthetic tradition. It is maintained that the experience is felt both by the artist and the responsive audience. So this is another important point which we find in, in the context of Indian aesthetics that so the enjoyment of uh, the bliss, the ananda of uh, aesthetic enjoyment, so that has been felt both by the artist, the time of the creation of the work, art object, and uh, it is also felt by the uh, response in the context of listening to a melodious music or in, in, the, in by reading the beautiful poem, etc. So the artist enjoys and at the same time, so that is uh, the, what the artist has created is enjoyed by the responsive readers or listeners. So in the context of uh, perhaps uh, one of you uh, know about the creation of uh, the creation of uh, uh, the, the sloka, the Adi sloka by Palmiki Muni, says by Palmiki. So that story of the hunter, the real hunter killing the uh, killing uh, one of the consorts of uh, twin Bart turns uh, turns a Bart. One was killed, and the, the other was uh, uh, expressing the sorrow of separation. So from that, the poet expressed the Adishloka. Manisa the Pritista, Tamagamas, Sitasama, the turns the Nadekam Badi, Ram Mosh. So that is the first. Shloka of uh, Adi Shloka of uh, Ramayana. And uh, whoever has uh, read that, that very Shloka, so if one is responsive, one will be, uh, one will feel the Karuna Rasa, which is uh, involved in the very Shloka itself, the sin of uh, Karuna of Shloka, so which creates the Karuna Rasa, especially unique form of rasa, karuna, compassion, rasa. So that is enjoyed by the readers. So artists may be affected when there is, but only when there is a heart to heart dialogue. So another technical term has been introduced by the Indian aestheticians, and uh, that is Hridayi Sambhat. So there must be a heart to heart dialogue within the poet and the reader. So then only the process of creation and enjoyment will be perfect. So there must be total rapprochement between the artist and the, and the enjoyer, the aesthetic. So, so this is uh, the, the point which has been emphasized by the Indian institutions. In the Indian, Indian aesthetic tradition, that importance has been attached to creativity on the part of the artist. So I have used the term Pratibhaolati. So Pratibha is a term which finds important place in both metaphysics and aesthetics. So one point I would like to raise is that in the Indian context, so there is a close link between uh, aesthetic theories and uh, philosophical uh, thoughts. And uh, as a matter of fact, so great aestheticians, Indian aestheticians like Avina Gupta and uh, many others, so they have their philosophical orientation in whether in the field of uh, Sankha Yoga or in the field of Vedanta or 
And that, that case, how I have been with the way fine is uh, the philosophy of orientation is Sebism, Kashmir Sebism. So Pratibha is taken, uh, is, a, is a term which finds important place in both metaphysics and aesthetics. So this I have mentioned. So we find the use of the term Pratibha in Patanjali, Patanjali then Bhattihari, Abhina Gupta, Raja Sakara, and other institutions. Asarya Abhina Gupta, so the great Saint philosopher and uh, aesthetician who had uh, brought aesthetics to the level of Sastra, to the level of philosophy, the great uh, philosopher, uh, say the philosopher of Tasmin, you, you know better. So uh, he wrote uh, uh, Abhinav Bharati, which is a commentary on Bharata Muni's Nathya Shastra. In Abhinav Bharati, he quoted from the writings of the great uh, stalwarts of those days and before him. So there some quotations have been made here and there. And uh, most of the those writers, so their writings are no more found, but some are also available. But uh, he referred to the work of one Bhattatauta, Sarya Bhattatauta, who happened to be his guru, his teacher, in the field of Lanka uh, uh, Sastra and philosophy. So he referred, he mentioned, he quoted Bhattatauta's definition of Pratibha. So where uh, the definition runs like this, Pragya nabo nabo namesis aleni pratibha mata. So which means, which means uh, if I translate in a rough way, so it says that pratibha is deafness. Pratibha is that pragya, it is that intellect, which by means of imaginative uh, creation, the poet is able to make innovative ideas and innovative works. So this is a very rough translation of uh, uh, Pratibha, definition of Pratibha, which uh, Abhinavakta mentioned in his, uh, in his great work, Abhinavabharati. Now, Abhinavabharati Sekara. So Rajasekara is another great Azariya uh, of Indian aesthetics. So he lived a little uh, before uh, it is uh, it is uh, it is intended, although no exact uh, date of the of his uh, birth and that uh, can be known in the present days. It is believed that he lived around uh, eight, uh, around ninth and the tenth uh, century AD. So. Then Raj Sakara among the Asariyas maintained that in order that the work of an artist, whether a poet or a great dramatist or a musician, so if any great work is to be to be created by the artist, then three factors, uh, three very important factors are necessary. So in Raja Sakara, uh, as well as uh, Avinokta, they refer to these three factors uh, which are involved in the creation of artwork. So these are, uh, these are number one, Pratibha. Uh, Pratibha, as, as I have mentioned, so that is creative genus, talent. So number two is, Yutpati. Yutpati, according to them, refers to the, the knowledge of the Shastras and the technical knowledge in that area of art in which the poet or the artist excels. So, Yutpati, that is training, isn't that? Secondly. 
And the third component, the third factor, which is uh, essential in the production of uh, great artwork is what we call a glass. So somebody may be trained in a particular field, in a particular uh, work of art, particular artwork, but uh, unless he practices it, unless he uh, makes a glass constantly with concentration, so he or she will not be able to produce great uh, artworks. So these three uh, components, these three factors, namely Pratibha, Vipati, and Abhyas, these are the essential uh, features, essential factors which are necessary in the great artworks. Now I come to the history of Western philosophy because so this is a very short uh, discussion and uh, I would like to cover that aspect also, some aspect of Western aesthetics. So naturally I have to refer to the contribution of Immanuel Kant. So he is uh, regarded as a great aesthetician in, um, the, in modern philosophy. And uh, like Abhinavagupta, Abhinavagupta of Kant had raised aesthetics to the level of philosophical respectability. Because uh, since the time of uh, Plato, Aristotle onwards, further and further, there are scanty works in the field of art and aesthetics, art and aesthetics, but uh, they did not raise fundamental issues in the field of uh, artistic creation, except, of course, David Hume in the history of uh, modern philosophy. And uh, before, just before Kant, we find that Hume had raised a very important, a pertinent uh, issue about aesthetics. So, in fact, we may, uh, in, in one sense, we may say that uh, it was Hume who had uh, raised skeptical doubts with regard to the with regard to creation of art. So uh, now uh, I would like to get out in the history of Western thought. Immanuel Kant raised a fundamental philosophical issue about the judgment of taste. So, about, so taste was the term which was uh, the thinkers uh, by, by the artists as well as the thinkers in those days. And uh, so far as the taste, so far as taste is concerned, taste uh, which uh, covers so many things, taste in the literal sense of enjoying the delicacy of food, uh, and uh, then the taste of beautiful objects, art objects, etc. So, with regard to this, so there's a, one a very important issue was uh, uh, raised uh, by before him also by uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas. So, Saint Thomas Aquinas, uh, as you know very well, is a great uh, uh, medieval philosopher. So, among his uh, writings. He referred to beauty, and uh, interestingly, the definition of beauty which uh, Saint Thomas Aquinas had raised that is uh, considered as uh, the the most uh, so, to, so to say the most beautiful definition of beauty. Uh, so he said, Saint Thomas Aquinas. By the way, uh, I would like to uh, mention. I would like to tell that uh, according to him, beauty is that which pleases when perceived. So beauty, that way is a taste. So beauty, something is said to be, something is said to be beauty, beautiful, if it pleases when we perceive it. When we listen to it, if it is a melodious music, uh, and uh, 
if uh, it is a beautiful, uh, I mean, natural object, so when we uh, perceive it, that is when we see it, we find it to be beautiful. Otherwise, there is no, there is no precise definition of beauty. So anyway, so apart from this, uh, he did not write uh, in detail about beauty and about art and so on and so forth. Now, before, before Kant, David Hume, in a famous essay titled Standard of Test, Hume's uh, Right. This essay is very, very important, and I would like to recommend my friends to read it if you have not so, so far read it. The standard of this very, very famous essay. So there, Hume maintained that a judgment that something is beautiful is a subjective judgment of this. And since this is something which is which the experiencer alone feels. This cannot be shared and validated. So this was a point which was raised by Hume, and very rightly so. So he said that. And uh, he added, he added the point that there cannot be a universally acceptable standard of this. So that's why the title of his essay is Standard of This. So there cannot be a uh, uh, ready-made standard or criteria for decide for determining something to be beautiful or not beautiful. So this is this this was the point at which you had raised. So I, I call it the the uh, skepticism in the field of aesthetics. As says there cannot be commonly agreed standard of this. This is what you had mentioned. Kant was very much aware about the significance of what Hume had claimed. So and, uh, in Kant's critique of uh, judgment, critique of judgment is his work on aesthetics. You know very well that Kant had in his uh, architectonic plan of critical philosophy, Kant uh, uh, wrote three critiques, critique of theorism, which was about uh, the possibility of science, about knowledge, then critique of practicalism, which is about the possibility of ethics, morality, justification of moral judgments. And the third critique is the critique of judgment. So he, uh, at one point, he remarked that, I quote, it is quite plain that in order to say that the object is beautiful and to say that I have taste, Everything turns on the meaning which I can give to this representation and not on any factor which makes me dependent on the real existence of the object, unquote. So this is from his critique of uh, judgment. So he said, uh, on, on the lines of what Hume had mentioned, so he said that when I uh, taste something when I find something beautiful, so that that is uh, more or less dependent upon my experience of it, and uh, I do not uh, I do not base my uh, taste my experience on the basis of the presence of something, on the actual existence of something, which uh, we may call I did not use uh, <laughs> the language that I am using, so but. Uh, uh, we may call the beautiful object, which exists as a, an object, as a, as a physical object or so, so on and so forth, but it depends entirely on the representation, so on, on my subjective feeling only, not on my cognition of the object uh, as is. The object as beautiful, so that I cannot say that it exists. Of course, later on he talks in the latter part of the critique of judgment. He writes about the noumenal basis of the uh, of beauty as the source of all the beautiful objects. Now, in the critique of uh, judgment, mm. Kant has devoted to the defense of the claims of this. So, as against the skepticism of Hume. Kant uh, thought that his purpose mm, was 
his uh, his purpose as a philosopher, as a, as, a, as a philosopher of aesthetics, his purpose was to defend, uh, uh, to counter the skepticism of Hume. Thus, in the case of uh, his uh, philosophy, that is in the critique of uh, purism pure also, he uh, confronted with Hume's skepticism and he, uh, he tried to counter it. So similarly, in the field of aesthetics also, he, uh, Kant, uh, Kant's purpose was to counter Hume and uh, to develop to develop uh, a philosophical justification, not in the sense of justification in the field of logic or science, not not in the cognitive area, in the cognitive field, but uh, but to justify that what I experience is something beautiful. So it has intersubjective validity. That is, when I find an object to be beautiful, so my claim that the object is beautiful on the basis of my experience, my taste of that object. So that others also, whoever has seen or heard that object, so he or she also feels similar, I mean, experience, not exactly similar, but uh, they also uh, say that, oh, this is beautiful, this object is beautiful. So Kant's main uh, purpose was to find this intersubjective validity, although uh, it, is not, uh, it is not validity in the logical sense, uh, nor in the epistemological sense, but validation he was concerned with. Uh, and the validation of the, the uh, intersubjective validity of the beauty, beauty, claim to beauty, claim to uh, beautifulness of the object of our test. So he said, we presume that our feeling, just like our scientific theories and moral beliefs, can be the subject of publicly valid discourse, and that there can be no rule by which anyone should be compelled to acknowledge that something is beautiful. We are nevertheless entitled to respond to a beautiful object with a universal voice and lay claim to the agreement of everyone. So this is a very important point which he said. So of course, I cannot share uh, the feeling that I have about uh, that beautiful rose, which I see, which grows in my garden, the same rose which uh, I guess uh, when uh, he or she comes, uh, he or she also claims that, oh, your rose is beautiful. So Kant said that. So from this uh, common, from this common acceptance, so to say, acceptance, not in the logical sense, so it has some validity. It has a universal voice uh, in, the, in the very word of Kant. It has a universal voice uh, and uh, uh, we can claim, we can lay claim to the agreement of everyone. Thus Kant aimed at the defense of the claim of this and the justification of intersubjective validity of aesthetic justice. So this is a great course, approach of Kant. And this is, uh, so to say, everybody who is interested in the field of aesthetics. So that this uh, issue raised by Kant, starting from Hume's skepticism to his uh, attempt to defend the intersubjective validity for the universal voice which we find in the appreciation of beauty. So this was a great contribution of Kant. Of course, there are many critics of Kant uh, who do not share uh, his uh, point of view. Aesthetic judgments can be neither true nor false, according to uh, Kant. So he, uh, he had spoken about uh, different kinds of judgments, such as the cognitive judgment, the moral judgment, the aesthetic judgment. So he said that aesthetic judgment cannot, uh, we cannot claim uh, we cannot uh, claim scientific truth so far as uh, this aesthetic judgment is concerned because uh, it is not a cognitive judgment. 
So it is aesthetic, it is reflective, it is not the determinant judgment uh, to use his thumbs. So aesthetic judgment can be neither true nor false, since to discriminate on the basis of the feeling alone is to contribute nothing to knowledge. So Kant said that when we enjoy um, the beauty of an object and uh, pass uh, an aesthetic judgment, aesthetic judgment, so we are not making any addition to our knowledge. We are not making we are not making any claim to scientific knowledge, but uh, scientific knowledge. This is what uh, Kant had mentioned. Now, of course, uh, by the way, this point has been objected to by Gadama. So in his uh, 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 in his works later on, so hermetic uh, standpoint. So because uh, uh, performance, artistic performance also, they can give us knowledge in one sense, the knowledge uh, of the society, of the community. So that uh, all, that aspect has been recognized by the by phenomenologists and hermetic sentiments. I'm not entering to that part. Kant says that such judgments aspire to be to a kind of intersubjective validity. He maintains that beauty is not a property of the object which can, which causes pleasure in us. At the same time, the pleasure in aesthetic response is disinterest. Of course, another important point raised by Kant is about the nature of the aesthetic attitude. So he used certain terms, so which are considered to be very important. He said that the pleasure in aesthetic response is disinterested. So this means that it is detached pleasure. Khan has given four requirements which determine the four moments in his analysis of aesthetic experience. So in the first part of his critical judgment, so the which is which is known as the analytic of the beautiful, Khan referred to the four moments. Uh, in, in aesthetic uh, judgment. And he had given definition of beauty also uh, in these four moments. So, number one, so, taste is the concept or a method of representing it by an entirely disinterested satisfaction. The object of such satisfaction is called beautiful. Number two, the beauty is that which Pleases universally without a concept. This is subjective universality. Number three, beauty is a form of the purposiveness on, of an object so far as this is perceived in it without any representation of a purpose. So this is what he called purposiveness without a purpose. Then uh, fourth moment, which he claimed, the beautiful is that which without any concept is cognized as the object of a necessary satisfaction. So Kant has used the term disinterestedness, detachment, etc. So one uh, thinker, European thinker by name Edward Bullo, so he introduced the term, uh, namely psychic distance. So he said that uh, Bullo, so he had, uh, this term is very, uh, uh, very important. In the, in the field of the psychology as well as in aesthetics, psychic distance. What Kant had uh, said uh, is uh, uh, when he talk about detachment or disinterestedness is uh, similar to what Edward Blow had uh, used the term psychic distance. Uh, now the point is that so in aesthetic judgment, in aesthetic experience, when we enjoy something with the beauty, beauty of an object, Object, art object. So we should not be, we should be far away from our uh, mundane, mundane line of thinking, from our from the practical concerns of our life. So that way we must be with us, we must be completely kept up uh, in the beauty of the object itself, to the experience itself. So that is what uh, Kant called this interest. Kant has very clearly distinguished 
aesthetic contemplation from the practical cognitive and appetitive interest. The aesthetic object may be real or imaginary, but what is aesthetically relevant is its, its manifest form and qualities as disinterested, disinterestedly held. Kant, however, says that only in the case of the experience of the, in the case of the sublime, of course. Uh, I would like to mention that Kant has met uh, the distinction between case and sublime. Sublime, as you know, is uh, the experience of the, the, the feeling of all which uh, we have when we find something, something very, very huge, uh, uh, something very, uh, very magnitude, uh, the size of something which uh, creates a sense of awe. For example, when we find, when we go by the side of the Himalayan mountain, so we have the sense of awe. This uh, kind of feeling is what he called, Khan called the sublime, feeling sense of the sublime. And in the Indian context, in the context of uh, Russia, Russia theory, so uh, the Indian aestheticians call it Adbutta Russia. And with the sublime. It must be said that Kant distinguishes between the beautiful and the feeling of the sublime. Kant maintains that the beautiful is that which pleases in disinterested contemplation, independent of any concern for real existence of the object. So, uh, now I would like to refer to one important term which Kant had introduced in his aesthetics, that Kant has brought in the concept of genius. So this is a very, very important aspect in Kant's aesthetic theory. Kant, of course, uh, following his architectonic plan, he was uh, proceeding in a very systematic manner in his critical, because uh, the just critical judgment, it forms uh, uh, an important aspect of his critical philosophy. So he has proceeded in a very systematic manner. Suddenly he has introduced the concept of the genius. And it is, I say, that it is quite interesting. And uh, creativity within, so he has introduced concept of genius and creativity within the ambit of his aesthetic theory. According to him, Genius is a talent for producing that for which no definite rule can be given. So he has uh, admitted while appreciating the beauty of artwork. So, so we cannot uh, frame uh, what criteria for determining, for deciding the beauty uh, of the object. And uh, there is no rule uh, when he uh, rule for artistic creation, especially in the context of fine arts. So there is no specific rule for the creation of the uh, of the fine art or the creative work. So in this context, the concept of genius has to be introduced. Talent is needed for the production of great uh, artwork. This is his point. He says that. Genius is a rare phenomenon, a favorite of nature, who is blessed with natural gift or talent. So in this respect, I would like to say that Kant's concept of genius and the Indian concept of Pratibha, so there is a lot of similarity between the two. Pratibha is genius. Of course, the philosophical standpoints of uh, Abhinna Gupta or Kant, so the, they cannot be the same because the Philosophical standpoints are different. They belong to two different cultures, backgrounds. So that way, but there is a lot of similarity between what Kant uh, had written about the genius and uh, what the Indian aestheticians had written about the Pratibha. The importance of genius has been uh, led by, has been attached by Kant. Similarly, importance of Pratibha, which is also a genius or talent has been uh, attached by the Indian institutions. Hmm. 
can't uh, further maintain that along with the uh, genius. So we have to, to use another technical term which can't cool the spirit or gist. So the spirit uh, of the work of the creation is also very important. So there is no specific rule for the creation of the spirit, but he has this. So, but he has uh, also recognized the importance of this along with the importance of the genius. So he said that though necessary is the model, the genius does not copy necessary slavishly. And though its work of art, which he produces, is an expression of his artistic insight, he is himself more often than not unaware of what he may to say till in the finished product it has set itself. Such unique activity can be accomplished for only in terms can be accounted for only in terms of inspirations. So Gandhi has recognized this point, in spite of his various attempt, his attempt to proceed in the and in the fashion of the critical philosophy. So he has recognized the importance of what he called the beast, the spirit, and, uh, and the inspiration. Khan holds that genius is the vehicle of a supra individual force whose comings and goings the artist himself can only partially control. Works of art, according to Khan, are the phenomenal expressions of the nominal realms of values. Beauty, like goodness, is born in a mysterious fashion. Since all genuine works are perfect and complete, they may well be regarded as the most adequate expressions of nominal value. So here in uh, so the latter part, particularly uh, latter part, he has introduced the concern as the basis of aesthetic value also, just as he referred to the concept of, uh, of God uh, is uh, the, the existence of God is one of the postulates of morality in the field of ethics. From this account, we find that Kant's notion of genius is based on his philosophical thoughts. Kant's account of genius suggests a more illuminating explanation of the universality and communicability of taste, genius provides us with the key for natural beauty. The artist teaches us to find beauty in nature. So this, this is what we claim. This artist can um, open our eyes to the beauty of nature, through genius. So this is also an interesting point which we find in answer work. Now, Coming to the last point, the last portion of my talk. Regarding the issue criteria for the appreciation of art, it is an uphill task to soak out the standards for several reasons, such as differences in the medium, Diction, craft, and modes of communication, technical requirements for different uh, art forms, then differences in uh, the theoretical approach, etc., etc. So it must therefore be. My point is that it is uh, not uh, an easy task; it is an uphill task to try to work out uh, criteria uh, of uh, art criticism because of several factors, some of which I have just mentioned. It must therefore be admitted that attempt to work out ready-made formula for artistic creation and appreciation is not possible. We may, in the broad sense, speak about the organic unity, that is to say, success in integrating complex elements within a unified group. So we may broadly speak about some of the, some of the requirements, 
such as what we uh, what SDG stands for organic unity. This very term organic unity was uh, used by Aristotle himself when uh, he uh, was writing about uh, the philosophy in general, metaphysics in general, and uh, and the aesthetics in particular. That is, there must be organic unity in the in the uh, in the artwork. He had uh, written that uh, poetics in the poetics he has emphasized this point about the organic unity of the tragic drama. So this way, success in integrating complex elements within a unified whole. So this can be one of the one of the requirements for determining the beauty. Then originality in the sense of breaking with current tradition in terms of vision, new ideas, composition, choice of diction, style, etc. To be some of the criteria of aesthetic excellence. In this context, the requirements for producing good art is Pratibha, Virpati, and uh, Abhyasa, laid down by Acharyas of Indian aesthetics, along with the primary importance which they have given to Russia in the production of literary and audiovisual art forms may be considered seriously. So I'm uh, referring to the Indian theory of aesthetics. Uh, theory of Russia in Indian aesthetic aesthetics. So I'm not uh, dwelling, uh, I'm not explaining the theory of Russia in this uh, brief talk, short talk. Anyway, I'm, I would like to uh, refer, I would like to give importance to the theory of Russia also, because um, if we have to uh, work on the lines of Indian aesthetics, we, we cannot uh, obliterate the theory of Russia. The uh, eight dresses, and subsequently the nine dresser, which you know, the head of the Santa Rasa. So those things we have to take into account also. Uh, however, regarding the theory of Russia, and then theory of Russia, so I would like to at this point that, however, uh, however, revisiting the traditional theory of Russia concerning its significance and contemporary relevance will be an important event. So instead of the, taking the theory of Russia so, uh, in itself, so it's uh, at one particular point of time was uh, considered to be uh, considered to be quinty sense of, uh, of uh, artistic creation and appreciation. But uh, of course, aesthetic uh, in Indian aesthetics, not only in Indian aesthetics, somebody has written about, uh, uh, written about uh, Western literary works also, well, considered in light of the theory of Indian, that's the theory. So that is quite possible, but uh, instead of uh, uh, accepting the theory of Russia as such without uh, any criticism. Uh, so what we have to do is uh, we need uh, revisiting the Indian theory of uh, Russia in the in the context of uh, its uh, modern relevance, contemporary applicability, and all that, because uh, new areas are coming up in the field of Art, different art forms are coming up because of uh, modern uh, computer science and uh, this uh, certain areas of audio visual uh, entertainment, etc. So, in the light of all these developments, so we need uh, to revisit the theory of art. We need a reorientation and uh, we see how relevant it is and uh, on what direction it can be taken so that uh, we may develop the uh, best theory of uh, aesthetics and uh, art criticism. So with these uh, few words, I conclude my
Thank you all very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Shamkishore Singh, sir, for your wonderful, insightful, and stimulating speech on the creativity in the domain of art and aesthetics. So once again, thank you so much, Professor Shamkishore Singh, sir. So we are very fortunate enough uh, that we have amid us Professor Robert Klemmer from uh, Kyoto University, Japan. Uh, I would like to request Professor Klemmer, sir, to share his valuable thought and observations and also a very brief summary already uh, delivered speech by the eminent speakers. Sir, please, Klemmer, sir. Thank you very much, Dr. Mascar. Um, I, won't, I won't talk for too long because I see we've been running for more than three hours already, but I, I don't want to summarize the, uh, the presentations and I know they're available on the YouTube recording. Anybody wants to go back to them. What I'd rather do would be to spend a few minutes perhaps drawing out what struck me as being very important points in each of these three very, very stimulating papers um, and throw them out perhaps for uh, the, the authors might want to think about these ideas or in the, in the subsequent discussion period. Um, so let, let me take them in the order in which the papers were presented, beginning with Professor Miri's very fascinating paper. Um, I think it raised some very fundamental questions, um, including this question of the source of values. And this seems to me to be particularly important in the contemporary world when I think many, many kinds of values are under attack or there's considerable uncertainty about you know, what basis to look for for making any kind of value judgments. And I think as Professor Murray pointed out, I mean, in, certainly in the Western tradition, uh, historically, of course, this was traced back to religion as the um, you know, in, an impeachable source of, of, of values, of value, of value statements, which he suggested involved some sort of faith in a monotheistic God. Perhaps this idea is also therefore shared actually not only by Christianity, but by Judaism and Islam uh, to, to a considerable extent as well. Um, it's very, very interesting when you look at attempts to create forms of aesthetic, uh, so, sorry, forms of secular ethics and as was very pointed out, there's been this something of an evolution, perhaps from the idea of happiness, possibly to the idea of liberty, or maybe somewhere even beyond this point. And the interesting thing is about secular ethics, I think, is that on the one hand, uh, paradoxically in a way, uh, secular ethics is often made as a kind of statement against religion or against the values which have been derived from religion, religion as to say there, there is still that religious background as the kind of template against which the, the values are being, are being or attempted to create some sort of secular values from this. Um, that, that's important, I think, to, to see that the extent to which, in fact, they draw, they draw still on, on that um, kind of religious background. Um, the other question then becomes on what basis you do attempt to establish a kind of system of secular ethics, uh, whether you look to something in the base of human nature or something like this um, is an interesting possibility. And I thought one of the most interesting ideas which, which could, we could perhaps debate much more thoroughly would be the point you only, I think, touched on really very much in passing for Samiri was the question of human rights. And if you start to deconstruct the notion of human rights, what this tells you about conceptions of you know, the human being, the existence of, of human nature, and the kind of core values on which our civilization is supposed to be based. And given that the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, I, I think has been signed by all governments, they don't observe it necessarily, but um, in principle, it, it, it does set out a kind of architecture for, um, what is acceptable, at least in a minimum level, for uh, treatment of human beings. And that, of course, the notion of human rights, of course, also then flows over into ideas of, of self and identity. So I think to unpack that idea is extremely important, particularly when, again, we go back to this religious question. Um, if you look at the notion of, if you look at Buddhism, for example, Buddhists, and as, as, as Abbaskar said, at the moment I'm in Japan, I'm teaching currently at the University of Kyoto, um, 
the way in which Buddhists indeed have struggled with the same kind of idea, particularly the idea of whether you can have a notion of human rights uh, on the basis of a religion, if you want to call it that, or form of psychology or thinking, which is essentially denies the existence of any kind of permanent self. So there are very, very fascinating comparative questions, I think, do arise when we take the debate out of the context of the Judeo-Christian religions and actually pose it in terms of you know, a much a much wider range of, of the world's religion. Um, very interestingly, I think also Professor Miri raised this question of, of animals, of, of the, right, the rights of animals. And this strikes me as extremely important, not only the question of the rights of animals, but the way in which ecology seems to emerge for very large numbers of people as being the basis from which new forms of values would be derived. I mean, in the context of climate change, for example, this is naturally going to raise profound ethical questions about responsibility, about reparations to those who have not created the, the, the problems that are going to emerge from climate change, but are victims of it. It's going to raise an awful lot of those questions. So I think to bring the question of ecology in the broad sense back into ethical debate uh, is, is an extremely important direction to take. Um, just two or three other, other thoughts. Um, when you quoted Nietzsche, I thought this was very interesting, this idea in a sense of, of, of where, where are the open spaces for human autonomy in, in a monolith, in a, mono, a monotheistic, a strict kind of monotheistic system, what, what spaces are left for, indeed, creativity, the very point that Professor Singh was bringing up. Um, some people have attempted to answer that question by, by invoking ideas as such as co-creation. You know, we're, we're not the primary creators of the universe. You know, we inhabit it along with these other animal species. But we do have a role, of course, in constantly shaping it, whether it's in the form of producing works of art or shaping it in other senses, sociologically, economically, you know, geographically, by the way we actually intervene in landscapes and so on. Um, it's a very interesting question. Two final thoughts. Um, perhaps we should also build in to this particular level of discussion. I, mean, I think the world's always been a violent place. I mean, so, so socially, politically, it's been violent. Uh, I think we're living in a period now of, of very, very considerable violence, whether at interstate level, you know, continuation of wars, conflicts, what are in fact, um, you know, get the, the news from many parts of the world so much of contemporary Africa, for example, at the moment is mired in, you know, disastrously violent uh, situations. Racist questions also of the nature of violence in this kind of model and also the nature of power. Again, running through a lot of Western philosophical thought or quasi-philosophical thought, you, people, you think of people like Michel Foucault, was in fact the idea of power. And the idea of power as being a form of value which shapes decisions and it it shapes activities, not simply of politicians, but of, of people across a vast range of, of, of um, forms of behavior. In fact, in, I think in Foucault's sense of the use of power, when he extended this to his notion, very celebrated notion of micro power, you know, he sees this extending even to interpersonal relationships, a very cynical view in a way, you know, there, there can't really be true love because what I'm actually doing is constantly trying to exercise power or some sort of hierarchical relationship in relation to my, my wife, my partner, or other people around me. And that's a view that should be properly taken into account when we're talking about modernity as well, the violence of modernity and the kind of ideas that we often use perhaps without, again, deconstructing them very much, such as words like development, what that actually means when you take it apart in terms of its ethical qualities the final point I would actually think of in relation to Professor Miri's paper was, it seems that one of the, one of the issues that the current COVID crisis has raised as, as in fact new kinds of, I know they're new ethical questions. It's certainly brought to the surface, I think, older ethical questions, which are, are now profoundly important, including the importance of reciprocity in terms of human relationships and in terms of notions of interdependence when we discover that in fact, whatever kind of competitive political structures we've had in the past, these don't work very well. These don't work when it comes to sharing of vaccines. It doesn't come to, uh, doesn't really apply when it comes to questions of you know, refusing to get vaccinated or to maintain social distance from other people, even though I might myself be a spreader 
of the of the virus, um, but refusing to accept a kind of responsibility towards other people, even if in some sense it infringes on my freedom, my freedom not to be vaccinated or my freedom you know, not to wear a mask or whatever. So I think I think Professor Mary, your paper is rich in many implications. Um, many of those issues that I've just pointed to, I think, would make wonderful further papers because they they themselves, once unpacked, you know, take us in fascinating um, ways of expanding the the kind of core ideas that you've you've uh, very fruitfully brought out. So thank you so much. Turning to Professor Pierre Bat's paper, um, well. A lot of the very fundamental philosophical questions <coughs> seems to take me back to my first year of this philosophy student, where we, you know, debated exactly these questions: what is truth? <laughs> you know, what's absolute truth? Can we have objective knowledge? And again, there's an interesting link, I think, back to Professor Miri's paper, because in many cases, I think when people talk about absolute truth, what they're really referring to is, in fact, some kind of religious truth. You know, scientific truth, as we know from experience, is provisional. Um, you know, and, and there's nothing so amusing in a way as going to a museum of the history of science. You know, you look at these these ancient instruments, you look at old maps, you look at these theories of you know the flat earth, phlogiston, whatever that, that were once the before any there was any idea of the circulation of the blood and so on. And I mean we're very aware of the provisionality of science. But I think I think Professor Bat's paper raised again a number of very very interesting questions, and again he, he raised many questions. So let me again just pick out three or four, which struck me as particularly fruitful questions to pursue. To have truth about the knowledge, of course, a, a knowledge, a, a objective truth, any kind of truth about about the world means that we understand, we have the capacity to understand the structure of that world. And there are two interesting questions that I would just like to raise to, for consideration here. What, one is whether, in fact, our brains, a question of physiology, not so much a question of philosophy, are in fact structured in such a way as to allow us to understand the structure of the world. If that were not the case, of course, objective knowledge would be completely absent from us. We could have ideas, we could have images about the world, but we would have no real way of accessing that knowledge. Um, it's not only the question of, of the natural sciences, this idea has is, is come up, the, the celebrated linguist uh, Noam Chomsky, for example, a lot years ago raised the same question about the nature of language, of course his celebrated theory that language is so complex that it would be impossible to learn a language if our brains were not predisposed to the process of language learning, that we must contain structures in our brains which allow us to assimilate language and to use it. He draws somewhere in one of his writings the analogy with a game, a game like an enormous game of chess. If you think of the number of words in a language, even in a single language, the number of possible combinations of that words, of course, they run into vast numbers. If you imagined a game of chess in which there were tens of thousands of pieces on the board, and an almost infinite number of possible moves you could make of any of those pieces, you could never play the game. It would be far beyond any kind of human capacity. So I think it's worth considering a sort of variation of Chomsky's argument here in relation to our knowledge of the external world in general. Is it in fact the case that our brains are in fact structured in order to um, be able to, to figure out those structures? If it's not, of course, and it's an issue that a number of you invoke Kant here, of course, the Kantian problem with, with this, right? Um, what can we actually know about the world? And can we know what we know? Or worse still, you know, can we know what we don't know? And the answer probably is, is no, of course, because if we have no ability to, to uh, figure out what those fundamental structures are, we do not have the tools which we can access knowledge of the world. And it seems to me one of the most interesting features or ways in which this might be done, since Professor Bat, you also raised the question of the philosophy of science, is in fact mathematics. Philosophy of mathematics is extremely fascinating. There are many, many issues there, of course, but one of the key issues is the question of do mathematical statements actually reflect the nature of the world? You know, they could be, of course, simply symbolic constructions which have no relationship to the real world outside. Um, they, they could have no, no function at all in that way. 
most mathematicians, I think, would argue that mathematics does, in some sense, mirror reality, or or a ways is a way of describing reality in symbolic terms. If that is true, something very very important is happening there. That we do, in fact, have a means through which we can access objective knowledge about the world and then express it back to ourselves and to other people in a symbolic language, the language of mathematics. A couple of other questions that are, 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 are excuse me a moment. Uh, that came up, sorry. Um, Professor Pat raised this interesting question of, uh, for example, <laughs> think, sorry, the third gender, you know, the fact that it, it there was one time when we were thought that they're, they're, you know, they're basically two genders, you're either male or female, and it was one of those classic. If you're if you're if you're male, you know you you can't be female. Now, in fact, of course, that would be um, challenged by a very large number of people. Raises this fascinating question of the relationship between the fluidity of interpretation and the fluidity of fact. What I mean by that? What I mean by that is simply: was it the case that, let's say, 50 years ago? There were no transgender people. Um, probably not, but the question is that the categories of interpretation which allow uh, alternative forms of sexuality to be identified and expressed now exist to us, uh, although they did not at that time. Does that mean the phenomenon did not exist, or does it simply mean that we did not have the categories? And of course, again, it takes us back to Kant to some extent, because you know, as anthropologists well know, when you're looking across cultures, different cultures, one of the things that is challenging is in fact to grasp the categories through which they structure the world. Those things can be, again, relating to Professor Singh's paper, something as interesting as notions of color. Um, if you go into an artist's supply shop and you ask for a tube of red paint, they have probably no idea what you're talking about because they will have dozens of shades of red, all of which have a, a name according to the classification of colors adopted by, by those who code colors, who, who use them for artistic purposes, who use them for things like interior decoration. Okay. There are, of course, cat cultures which have almost no color words at all, have a very, very tiny range of colors. Does that mean they do not see colors? in the way that those who have a larger vocabulary of color vocabulary do? Or does it mean that they simply have not created categories to contain what appears empirically to their senses? So we have that very interesting question of categories. Um, now my final point about Professor Baskin is this very interesting question of all possible worlds. Would truth apply or would, would absolute truth apply in all possible worlds? But I'm glad he qualified that by saying, well, probably all probable worlds, because of course, all probable worlds are ones that are within our scope of imagination to grasp. All possible worlds, I think, lie outside our conceptual uh, management at all, because we don't even know what they might be like. Science fiction writers often struggle with this idea. And I've, I've tried it various times in life reading science fiction, and I usually find it disappointing because despite its claims to be able to, in a sense, create fictionally um, alternative worlds, mostly they simply turn out to be a version of our own world with, with either lots more technology or um, you know, a, a, re a recursion to some kind of rather medieval lifestyle, again, probably with, with technology. You think of the classic movies like Star Wars, they're not really other possible worlds there are other worlds which are rather like our world, but transposed into a different kind of register. So as Professor Bat pointed out, um, in the phenomenal world, the world that we can know, I think is likely to structure our senses of what is in fact considered to be possible in thinking about the truth of that world. Finally, very briefly, let me talk to turn briefly to Professor Singh's paper, full of uh, remarkable amount of material, a whole little book there, I think, Professor Singh, right? since you've covered so many of the bases, bases of, of aesthetic thinking. Okay, let me just pick out one or two ideas um, we might want to discuss. Um, the notion of creativity itself, even, even when confined to the, art, the, the, the domain of art and aesthetics, is of course, is a, is a, is a complex notion. I mean, we, we mostly have a notion of a kind of spontaneous creativity in the sense that very small children, given a few 
blocks of wood or some dirt and twigs and so on would immediately create games of cooking, of building, of doing whatever, as opposed to creativity in the arts, which I think we also have to recognize, although there is, there is indeed such a, a, a mysterious thing in a way, which we probably don't have a very clear way of talking about. It's also structured by what some sociologists of art call the art world, that is to say the, the way in which certain kinds of creativity are, award, are rewarded, are recognized, you know, others are, are marginalized. They may appear later, and indeed the history of art suggests that they do. If you look at the, the history of art, you find time and time again, um, major artistic innovations. You think of something like cubism in Western painting were regarded with horror by lots of people for a long time before they entered the canon. You know, they slowly became assimilated into what was acceptable as artistic expression. So I think, I think we have an interesting question there about the relationship between some kind of spontaneous, and again, you didn't go into it, of course, but the thing, this question of like genius, you know, where does this, where does this arise from? Is it, is it a kind of intrinsic quality of certain beings have, have some remarkable talent or something? You think of Mozart, you know, creating, writing an opera at four years old or something like this, you yeah. know? Um, I certainly wasn't writing operas at four years old. I can't write an opera now, okay? So there was something there. But the way in which can it be cultivated? Can creativity, is creativity that simply spontaneous um, ability, a talent, essentially, something innate, essentially? Or is it something that can be cultivated in the sense of through artistic education? You know, and I've heard, I've heard, some of my people that I know, some people have gone to art school and said it was wonderful. Other people I know have gone to art school. There, there was no point. They can't teach you creativity, right? They can teach you techniques. They can teach you how to do more fluid oil painting. They can teach you sculptural techniques and so on, right? But they can't teach you the creativity, which you will then use to transpose that raw material, the oil paint, the, 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 play, the clay, the wood, the stone, whatever it is, into a work of art. Um, the question of comparative ethics then I think becomes very, very important because this becomes not simply a conceptual question within an aesthetic tradition, let's say like Western tradition. But when you start to look at aesthetics across cultures, of course, we find very quickly that there are different, there are very different images of which, the way in which um, aesthetic notions are presented. Um, and again, they, they themselves often go back to ideas that, that have religious roots. We seem to keep coming back to that question. Yeah? There is the notion that certainly circulated that you know, creation is divine, but this kind of sub-creation, which we call art or other, other forms of creative activity, um, are a kind of pale reflection of that, of that primary uh, creativity. Which, which we cannot, which we do not have the powers, no human being has the powers to undertake that crime, kind of primary creation we can't create out of nothing, which is of course the theory of a number of religions. Rather, there are muses, you know, there are muses or diamonds, not, 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 not demons, right, but diamonds, forces, artistic, artistic um, how shall I put them, forces that work in some people to a profound level and lead them in fact to create um, there are other questions too, I think, and your paper was so rich, Professor, saying that I couldn't pick out a lot of them. Just let me pick out three final, very quick ideas. One is Gandhi's relationship to art, which I, I actually wrote a paper about very recently. His, his rather ambiguous relationship, his, his attraction certainly to music, but his relative lack of interest or attraction to the visual arts and, and the question that he raised himself. Of, of the question between art and truth. Um, there's a whole area to explore there, I think. There's the question of imagination and whether imagination and creativity are actually the same thing or whether they are different in important respect. And I, I would end up here with the thought, there was a Nobel Prize winning Mexican poet, man by the name of Octavio Paz, you may have heard of. He lived in India for some time. He was the Mexican ambassador to India, uh, Nobel Prize winner. He won the Nobel Prize in literature. And he wrote a great deal of poetry. He also wrote lots of little essays about all sorts of things, including India, by the way, um, which are worth reading. One of his essays, he says something interesting, which I will quote to. He says, imagination, says, 
a faculty of our nature to change itself. Okay, which means the creativity in his sense or imagination, I'm not saying they're necessarily the same thing, therefore it's not simply um, a way of producing literature, art, you know, objects of beauty or whatever kind or creativity may not necessarily produce only beautiful objects, of course, but has a dynamic dimension to it. Dynamic in the sense that it is one of the abilities we have as human beings to see what we're doing and to interact with the world through that imaginative capacity that we have. In other words, it may not be reason that is the primary human faculty. It may be imagination. It's certainly worth an idea worth, worth I think, thinking about or talking about. So let me end there. Thank you very much, all three presenters, because I think I can only touch on a tiny limited number of the issues that each one of you have raised. Uh, but I think they've given us a huge amount of food for thought. So thank you so much for that stimulating experience. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Bhaskar. Uh, for your wonderful and uh, remarkable summary on the delivered theme of philosophy, ethics, and aesthetics. So we are really, really grateful and thankful to you, Glamour, sir. Now, uh, I would like to request Dr. Tejasa Kolita to follow up the interactive section. Tejasa. Okay, Master. Uh, due to time constraint, we'll be able to take only one question. There are some questions in the chat box, but I have selected only one question. This question is, uh, this question is for Singh, Professor Singh, sir. It is asked by uh, Dr. Janavi Deka of Gauhati University. Her question is, can the subject called philosophy itself is understood as an artwork as without creative sensitivity it is not possible to understand the significance of the subject. Thank you uh, for raising this very interesting uh, question. And in fact, philosophy itself is the product of uh, creativity. This is what I would like to put that way. And uh, you know that philosophers in the history of philosophy. So they were all uh, uh, creators. They have created uh, new ideas. They have created thoughts, new thoughts. And, uh, and uh, of course, they have uh, taken the subject matter in the wider sense, the whereas the artist's uh, interest is confined uh, in some aspects uh, of our life, uh, whereas the philosopher's interest is uh, very comprehensive, as you know. But anyway, the way the philosophers uh, uh, advance their ideas, the arguments uh, which they have uh, given, so all these are very beautiful. And uh, I think that uh, one should, uh, it will be a very interesting study if we, if we uh, to take up uh, this uh, as uh, uh, in our line of research, uh, we can look at philosophical writings. From it. So how the philosophers, the metaphysicians have created uh, models of the universe. So model making, so we can uh, uh, consider it as a field of research. So how the philosophers develop uh, metaphysical models? I'm giving a, an example. So that itself uh, can be taken as a, as a subject in aesthetics. So thank you very much for your very important query. Thank you. Uh, we'll uh, take another question. It is asked, it will be asked by Professor Anangiri of Madras University. Sir, you can ask. Sir, 
sir anangiri sir you can ask sir you are mute sir please unmute your please yeah. yes so thank you so much thank you so much professor professor <laughs> professor bad professor sing and professor flamer a uh, very rich set of uh, insights a uh, beginning with professor miri thank you again for your deep set of reflections for the very category of the abrahamic for example now is there a distinction between abraham and the abrahamic because the whole abrahamic system that you are referring to it begins with abraham and abraham didn't create these systems so how do we understand abraham way of being taking help for example from soren kierkegaard now abraham in soren kierkegaard's fear and trembling does it reflect the kind of the moral system that you are referring to with the name abrahamic again with the abrahamic even if these three religions the judaism christianity and islam now the actual practice and the evolutionary development of these religions and the complex dialectic between the secular and transcendental here needs to be taken into consideration within christianity for example let us look at saint francis of assisi and pope francis and of course in judaism also the difference between old testament and the talmudic way of seeing in fact there might be very interesting resonance between hermeneutics the vedic hermeneutics and talmudic hermeneutics in in terms of a kind of a lack of fixity as it becomes quite open ended then your uh, reference to faith faith as a kind of speech denying activity or kind of speech silent activity but faith also can embody both speech and skepticism for example paul tillich in his dynamics of faith he tells us how whole faith includes skepticism if you look at habermas for example how he talks about linguistification of the sacred therefore language and the sacred have multiple kind of interaction which invite our consideration then about satyagraha also in that spirit satyagraha is silence but satyagraha is also speech and action and finally about sachidananda how this whole realization of this this whole construction or reference to sachidananda as beyond space and time is one reference with gandhi also sachidananda becomes part of the world especially with sri aurobindo as sri aurobindo said it is not god which has created the world god has become the world therefore with that realization of sachidananda as becoming the world and how do we understand liberation my quick query to professor singh is that while talking about kant and kant's aesthetic you made a very interesting reference to the the issue of intersubjective validity with the aesthetic judgment i would like to submit that the nature of this intersubjective validity how do we understand it in terms of a kind of interpretative validity and what what is the dynamics of that intersubjective validity and whether it involves a transformation of the accepted notion of subjectivity and objectivity thank you Uh, professor anon giri sir are you referring to miri sir or sham kishor singh sir my second query was to professor sham singh or uh, professor singh about uh, about intersubjective uh, yes validity and the first query uh, you want to <laughs> professor miri sir yes yes i think miri sir is so uh, uh, let's start from our uh, singh sir then oh yes Much thank you very much uh, for putting this question about Kant. So the 
And uh, in my talk, I have referred to the intersubjective validity, um, which Kant had referred in his aesthetic theory. Uh, now, so far as validity is concerned, in this context, in the context of aesthetics, Kant uh, is not uh, claiming objective validity. I mean, in the context of uh, uh, so this, uh, scientific knowledge, so the validity, so which is, uh, which is referred to in that context, is different from the validity uh, in the aesthetic sense. Because in this case, uh, it is related with taste, as I uh, mentioned again and again. In, in the philosophy of Kant is about the taste, which is uh, purely subjective, which in the true sense of the term cannot be shared objectively. Uh, so it is not a part of knowledge, knowledge claim. But on the other hand, it is related with the feeling. So intersubjective validity, Kant, according to Kant, so is used in a very limited technical sense. Technical sense in which two persons who have uh, experienced the same thing, who have appreciated the beauty of an object, an art object. So the Kant maintains that uh, Although the feeling of one person cannot be felt by another person, because it is purely subjective, but yet there can be some sort of uh, rapproche between the two, because uh, both the subjects, both the individuals are uh, experiencing or uh, perceiving the same thing, and at the same time, both have the feeling. Although that feeling cannot be uh, objectively validated, but still there can be communication. So this is a special uh, way uh, in which Kant was talking about uh, yes, intersubjective validity, not in the scientific uh, sense, uh, nor in the uh, musical sense. Thank you. Okay, sir, thank you. I think uh, Professor Minister is uh, not available. Uh, okay, sir. The question uh, given by raised by our respected Anand Giri sir will be discussed afterwards. It will be in virtual also. So now I uh, request Tejasa to follow up the her direction. Thank you, Vaskada. Due to time constraint, we'll not be able to take any more questions. I think. Uh, Professor Sir, uh, Singh Sir has already answered the questions and all the participants have satisfied. Now, I request Joynika Roy, Assistant Professor, Department of English, to please offer the vote of thanks. Thank you. At the outset, I'd like to convey my sincere gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Professor Kandrapadas, for his encouragement and support. I extend my heartfelt thanks to the distinguished speakers for their valuable deliberations and enlightening us on the varied aspects of philosophy, ethics, and aesthetics. I would like to thank the director of Hujja Kumar Bhuya School of Social Sciences, Professor Joydeep Borua, for his constant support and guidance. My sincere gratitude to Professor John Robert Clamor for his kind presence and for sharing his valuable observations with us. I'd also like to thank Srinibir Dev Sharma for his melodious presentation. I extend my gratitude to Indian Council of Philosophical Research, New Delhi, for sponsoring this online event. I sincerely thank our technical team for the smooth conduct of this program. Last but not the least, I offer my heartfelt thanks to all the dignitaries, guests, colleagues, and students for their active participation and making this event a success. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.